Good Night, Mr. Tom by Michel Magorian. Read by Patrick Malahide. Yes, said Tom bluntly on opening the front door. What do you want? A harassed middle-aged woman in a green coat and felt hat stood on his step. He glanced at the armband on her sleeve. I'm the billeting officer for this area, she began. Oh, yes, what's that got to do with me? She flushed slightly. Well, Mr... Mr... Oakley. Thomas Oakley. Uh, thank you, Mr. Oakley. She paused and took a deep breath. Mr. Oakley, with the declaration of war imminent, Tom waved his hand. I knows all that. Get to the point. He noticed a small boy at her side. It's him I've come about, she said. I'm on my way to your village hall with the others. She stepped to one side. Behind the large iron gate which stood at the end of the graveyard were a small group of children. Many of them were filthy and very poorly clad. "'You are entitled to choose your child, you know,' began the woman apologetically. Tom gave a snort. "'But,' she continued, "'his mother wants him to be with someone who's religious or near a church. She was quite adamant, said she would only let him be evacuated if he was.' "'Was what?' asked Tom impatiently. "'Near a church.' Tom took a second look at the child. The boy was thin and sickly-looking, pale with limp sandy hair and dull grey eyes. "'His name's Willie,' said the woman. Willie, who had been staring at the ground, looked up. Round his neck, hanging from a piece of string, was a cardboard label. It read, "'William Beach.' Tom was well into his sixties, a healthy, robust, stockily-built man with a head of thick white hair. Although he was of average height, in Willie's eyes he was a towering giant with a voice like thunder. He glared at Willie. "'You'd best come in,' he said abruptly. The woman gave a relieved smile. "'Thank you so much,' she said, and she backed quickly away. Nervously, Willie followed Tom into a dark hallway. I suppose you'd best know where to put your things, muttered Tom, looking up at the coat rack and then down at Willie. He scratched his head. Bet I for you. I'd best put in a low peg. Give me your Macintosh and I'll put it on top of mine for now. Tom took it and hung it on top of his own greatcoat. Come on, he said. Willie followed him in, into the front room. It was a small, comfortable room with two windows. One looked out onto the graveyard, the other to a little garden at the side. A large black range stood solidly in an alcove in the back wall. Willie glanced at an armchair by the range and the objects that lay on top of the small wooden table beside it. A pipe, a book, and a backy jar. Pull that stool up by the fire and I'll give you something to eat. Willie made no movement. Go on, sit down, boy. He repeated. Tom cooked two rashers of bacon and placed a slab of bread with a fresh bacon dripping beside it onto a plate. He put it on the table with a mug of hot tea. Willie watched him silently. Eat that up, said Tom. Willie dragged himself reluctantly from the warmth of the fire and sat at the table. He bit into the bread, but a large lump in his throat made swallowing difficult. He didn't feel at all hungry, but remembered apprehensively what his mum had said about doing as he was told. "'And you hungry?' asked Tom from his armchair. Willie looked up, startled. "'Yes, mister,' he whispered. He stared miserably at the plate. Bacon was a luxury. "'Ma, well, maybe you can chew it more easy later.' Tom beckoned him over to the stool. Put a spoon of that sugar in, boy, and bring your tea over here. 
Willie did so. What you got in your bag, then? I, I don't know, mumbled Willie. Mum pecked it. One of his socks slid halfway down his leg, revealing a large, multicoloured bruise on his shin and a swollen red sore beside. What's a nasty old thing? Tom said, pointing to it. What gave you that? Willie paled and pulled the sock up quickly. Best drink that afore it gets cold, said Tom, sensing that the subject needed to be changed. He left the room briefly and within a few minutes returned. I gotta go out for a spell and I'll fix up your room, see? Up there! And he pointed to the ceiling. Here's an old scarf of mine, he muttered, and he threw a khaki object over Willie's knees. Have a wander in the graveyard. Willie heard him slam the front door and listened to the sound of his footsteps gradually fading. He hugged himself tightly and rocked backwards and forwards on the stool. Um, I must be good, he whispered urgently. Um, I must be good, and he rubbed a sore spot on his arm. He was such a bad boy. He knew that. Mum said she was kinder to him than most mothers. She only gave him soft beatings. Mum said war was a punishment from God for people's sins, so he'd better watch out. She didn't tell him what to watch out for, though. His eyes rested on the stool where the woolen scarf lay. He'd go outside. The graveyard and cottage with its garden were surrounded by a rough stone wall, except for where the back of the church stood. Between the graves lay a small, neat flagstone pathway down the centre. A large oak tree stood in the centre of the graveyard by the path. Willie glanced down at a small stone angel near his feet and began to walk round the gravestones. He was sitting on one Elizabeth Thatcher when he heard voices. A young man and woman were passing by. They were talking and laughing. They stopped and the young woman leaned over the wall. Her long, fair hair hung in a single plait. Pretty, he thought. You're from London, aren't you? she said, smiling at him. He stood up. Yes, miss. The young man was in uniform. Well, how old are you then? she asked. Eight, miss. Polite lad, ain't you? What's your name? William Peach, miss. Well, you can stop calling me miss. I'm Mrs. Mrs. Hartridge. The young man beamed. I'll see you on Monday at school. I expect you'll be in my class. Goodbye, William. Bye, Miss Erm, um, Mrs. he whispered. He'd forgotten all about school. He thought of Mr. Barrett, his form master in London. He spent all day yelling and shouting at everyone and rapping knuckles. A loud, sharp barking suddenly disturbed the silence. Willie sprang to his feet. A small black and white collie ran around the tree and into the leaves. It stopped in front of him and jumped up into the air. Willie was petrified. Them poisonous dogs, he heard his mother's voice saying inside him. One bite from them mats and you're dead. He picked up a thick branch from the ground. You, you go away, he said feebly, gripping it firmly in his hand. You go away. The dog sprang into the air again and barked and yapped at him. Willie let out a shriek and drew back. The dog came nearer. I'll, I'll kill you. I wouldn't do that, said a deep voice behind him. He turned to find Tom standing by the outer branches. He ain't gonna do you no harm. Willie froze. Sweat broke out from under his armpits and across his forehead. Now he was for it. Tom came towards him. I think you and I'd better go inside and sort a few things out. Willie walked shakily towards the cottage, his head lowered. His armpits stung savagely, and a sharp pain stabbed at his stomach. He walked through the front door and stood in the hallway. Tom went into the front room and stood waiting for him. Don't dither out there. Come on in. Willie did so, but his body felt as if it no longer belonged to him. Tom's voice grew more distant. He sat down on the stool, feeling numb. 
Tom picked up a poker and walked across to the fire. Now he was going to get it, he thought. About Sammy, he heard Tom say. He watched him poke the fire, and then he didn't hear any more. He knew that Tom was speaking to him, but he couldn't take his eyes off the poker. He saw Tom's brown, wrinkled hand lifted out of the fire. The tip was red, almost white in places. He watched the tip of the poker spin and come closer to him, and then the floor came towards him, and it went dark. He felt two large hands grip him from behind. Tom opened the front window and lifted him out through it. "'Breathe in deep,' Willie heard him say. "'Take in a good sniff.' I, I, "'I'll be sick,' he mumbled. "'That's right. Go on. I'm holding you.' Willie drank in more air. A wave of nausea swept through him, and he vomited. Tom wiped his mouth and face with the scarf. The pain in Willie's stomach had gone, but he felt drained like a rag doll. Tom lifted him back into the cottage and placed him in his armchair. He tucked a blanket round him, drew up a chair by the fire, and watched Willie fall asleep. He looked at the poker leaning against the range. He never thought, no, surely not, he murmured. Oh, Thomas Oakley, where have you landed yourself? There was a sound of scratching at the front door. Sammy bounded in, panting and yelping. Now you just shut that old mouth, he whispered firmly. There's someone asleep. He knelt down and Sammy leapt into his arms. Well, Sam, I don't know nothing about children, but I do know enough not to beat them and make them that scared. He found some steps and placed them under a small square trapdoor above him. He climbed up, pushed the trapdoor open, and pulled down a long wooden ladder. The ladder was a little over forty years old, but since his young wife Rachel had died soon after it was made, it had hardly been used. He opened the door opposite the front room. It led into his bedroom. Beside the bed was a fitted cupboard with several shelves. Tom opened it. On the third shelf were various belongings of Rachel's that he had decided to keep. He glanced swiftly at them. A black wooden paint box, brushes, a christening robe she'd embroidered, some old photographs, letters and recipes. The christening robe had never been worn by his baby son, for he had died soon after his mother. He picked up some blankets and sheets and carried them into the hall. I'll be down for you in a minute, Sammy, he said as he climbed up the ladder. Willie gave a short start and opened his eyes. In a chair opposite sat Tom, who was drinking tea and looking at a book. Sammy now stood at his feet. Tom looked up. You feeling better? You looking better? He poured him out a mug of hot, sweet tea and handed it to him. Willie looked apprehensively at Sammy. He won't harm you. He's a spry old thing, but he's as soft as butter, and you old boy and he knelt down and ruffled his fur. Willie leaned forward and stroked him. Sammy gave his fingers a long lick. He likes you, see? When he licks you, that's his way of saying, I likes you and you makes me happy. Smells like rain, said Tom, leaning out of the front window. Put your Macintosh on. He needs a romp in the fields. The three of them trooped out into the hallway. Willie stared at the ladder. Well, that's your room up there, sort of attic. Mine? He didn't understand. Did Mr. Oakley mean he was going to have a room to himself? Tom handed him his thin Macintosh and nodded. They walked down the pathway and out of the gate, Sammy leading. Tom striding after him and Willie running to keep up with them. It was late afternoon now. 
Tom slowed down and Willie walked more easily beside him. He stared up at the gruff old man who was so kind to him. It was all very bewildering. A plump, middle-aged woman with greying auburn hair was peering out of a cottage window. She disappeared for an instant and opened her front door. Hello, Tom, she said, looking with curiosity at Willie. He grunted. Evening, Mrs. Fletcher. William, go and keep an eye on Sam. I'll be with you in a minute. Willie nodded shyly. Skinny old scrap, ain't he? said the woman. Tom gave another grunt. How's the knitting coming on? said Tom, changing the subject. Busy, are you? No more than usual. Could do with a thick jersey. Not, not for me, mind. You ain't got to clothe them, you know. Look, said Tom, can you knit me a jersey, or can you not? That's what I'm asking. Oh, if that's what you want. He mumbled his thanks and strode on up the road. Next, Tom led Willie round the back of a large cream-coloured farmhouse towards a wooden shed. A middle-aged man with corn-coloured hair was sitting on a stool milking one of a handful of cows. Mister, said Willie, tugging at Tom's coat sleeve. Mister, what's that? Tom was astounded. Ain't you never seen a cow? But Willie didn't answer. I'll be wanting extra milk from now on, Ivor, Tom said. Ivor nodded and glanced at Willie. One of them London lot? he asked. Tom grunted. You best take a jug with you, rose inside. Tom tramped across the yard to the back of the house and up the steps. Willie stayed to watch the milking. When he returned, Tom tapped him on the shoulder. Here, dreamer, you carry that, he said, handing him a tin jug. Take a look if you have mind. Willie lifted the lid and peered in. Fresh milk. Where's that old thing? said Tom, looking round for Sammy. He caught sight of his black and white fur at the gate. Willie looked at the front of the house. The woman was putting up some black material at the front window. What's she doing? Willie asked. Putting her blackouts up, boy. We've all got to do it from tonight. As they neared the foot of the hill, the sky opened and a heavy torrent fell mercilessly down. It blinded Willie and trickled down inside the collar of his Macintosh. Back at the cottage, they ran into the hall, Tom's boots clattering on the tiles. Are you soaked through? said Tom. He pointed to Willie's bespattered plimsolls. Take them old canvas things off. After much shuffling from the living room, Tom opened the door. He'd laid newspaper in front of the range. He lit a gas lamp which hung from the ceiling. You stay on them newspapers, you too, he said to Sammy, who was panting rapidly. He added some coke to the fire and left the room. When Tom returned, he was carrying Willie's brown paper bag. He placed it on the table and took out the contents. There was one small towel, a piece of soap, a toothbrush, an old Bible, and an envelope with To Whom It May Concern written on it. He looked under the towel for some night clothes, but there were none. He opened the envelope. Willie knew the letter was from his mum. Dear sir or madam, it read, I asked if Willie could go and stay with God-fearing people, so I hope he is. Like most boys, he's full of sin, but he's promised to be good. I can't visit him. I'm a widow and I haven't got the money, the war and that. I've put the belt in for when he's bad and I've sewn him in for the winter. Tell him his mum said he'd better be good. Mrs. Beach. Tom folded the letter and put it into his pocket. He found the belt at the bottom of the bag. It was a brown leather one with a steel buckle. He put it back in the bag and took out the towel, soap, and toothbrush. Willie stood with his back to the fire and stared uneasily up at him. Tom was angry. While you're in my house, you'll live by my rules. I ain't ever hit a child, and if I ever do, it'll be with the skin of me hand. You got that? Willie nodded. So, well, we can forget the old belt. He went out and returned with a bundle of clothing. You best get out of them wet things, he said, kneeling down beside him, so's I can dry em for tomorrow. 
"'Barn them socks,' he said as Willie clung to the tops of them. He pulled them off. Tom said nothing. There was no need. Willie's arms and legs were covered in bruises, wheels, and sores. Tom went to pull off his vest. Willie flinched and touched the top of his arm. Uh, "'New one, eh?' he asked quietly. Willie nodded and blushed. "'Best be careful, then.' And he tugged gently at the vest. It, 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 won't, it won't come off, mister, said Willie, and then Tom understood what his mother had written in the letter. His vest had been sewn to the waist of his undershorts. Soon settle that, said Tom, picking up a pair of scissors from the bookcase. Tom dried Willie's thin, bruised body, wrapped him up in a towel, and sat him in the armchair. Taking an old flannel nightshirt from the bundle, he cut the body and sleeves in half. He stood Willie on the armchair, took the towel away, and placed the nightshirt over his head, cutting more away from the hem until Willie's toes and hands came into view. He handed him a thick pair of woolen socks. The heels almost reached the back of Willie's knees. Willie gave a small, tense smile and watched Tom hang his things over a clothes horse near the fire. Tom then cracked some eggs into a saucepan, adding milk and butter. Presently he spooned a large quantity of steaming scrambled eggs onto two plates. A bowl of hot, buttered, boiled potatoes stood in the middle of the table. "'You can sit down now,' said Tom. Feverishly, Willie attacked the meal. His small elbows stuck out at the sides as he cut and ate food in a frenzy. "'You can look through them books if you like.' Tom said when the meal was eaten. He indicated the shelves under the side window. Willie got up from the table excitedly and moved towards them. Then he stopped and frowned. I've I got to read the Bible, he said miserably. Tom gave a grunt. I'll tell you a Bible story myself, in me own way, that do you? Oh, yeah. Thanks, mister. Tom sat down in the armchair and lit his pipe. He leaned back, puffing at it, wondering which one to tell. "'Noah's Ark!' he exclaimed. "'That's a good un. He looked at the books Willie had chosen and picked some others from the bookcase with animal pictures in them. "'Once long ago,' began Tom, and Willie, sitting beside him, leaned forward to listen. When Tom had finished, he found Willie gazing at him with adoration. Feeling a little embarrassed, he quickly cleared his throat and glanced up at the clock. He made Willie cocoa and left him with Sammy while he went upstairs to put up more blackouts. Soon he reappeared. They made a cocoa, William, and you carried the book. Willie climbed up the ladder, but the enormous socks kept making him slip. After much balancing and juggling with cocoa, book, and dog, they all three eventually reached the attic. It was a tiny room shaped rather like a ridged tent. Tom had swept the room clean and had fixed a lamp to a hook on the white plaster ceiling. It was hanging there, a light. Beside the bed was a low wooden table. "'For your books and such,' said Tom. He pointed to a china chamber pot on the floor at the end of the bed. "'That shows you don't have to go outside if you want to go to the toilet,' he explained. Willie crawled under the bed and curled up into a ball. "'What you doing?' asked Tom. "'You gets into it, not under it.' "'What? Right, right inside?' exclaimed Willie. Tom drew back the sheets, and Willie climbed in between them. He stroked the blankets with his hands. Sammy, meanwhile, was standing impatiently at Tom's side, wagging his tail in lunatic fashion. "'Oh, go on, you daft dog!' said Tom, and he leapt onto the bed between Willie's arms and licked his face. Slowly, Willie put his arms around him, gave a small cry, and burst into tears. "'Sorry, mister,' he blurted out, and he buried his head into the dog's fur. "'I, I ain't ungrateful, mister. Honest, I'm, I'm happy.' And with that he gave another sob. Tom nodded, and Sammy licked one of the tears from his face. Tom moved towards the bed and gently ruffled Willie's hair. 
He was halfway down the hatch with Sammy in his arms when he remembered something. Don't forget them old prayers. No, no, mister, said Willie. He paused for an instant. And you best call me Tom. Good night and God bless. Good night, Mr. Tom, Willie whispered. When Willie awoke, it was still very dark. The pain that had brought him sharply back to consciousness seared violently through his stomach. He held his breath and pushed his hand down the bed to touch his nightgown. It was soaking. It was then that he became aware that he was lying in between sheets. That's what they did to people after they had died. They laid them out in a bed. Doubled over with the pain in his gut, he hobbled over to the window and let out a frightened cry. He was in a graveyard. He gave a loud moan and with a sudden wretch vomited all over the floor. In the morning Tom found him huddled under the bed. The sheets were drenched in urine. He stripped them off the mattress and carried Willie down to the living room. Tom pulled the voluminous nightshirt over his head and threw it into a copper tub with the sheets. He sluiced Willie's body tenderly with cold water and soap. The wheels stuck out mauve against his protruding ribs and swollen stomach. He could hardly stand. S sorry, mister, he kept repeating fearfully. Sorry, Mr. Tom. Tom just grunted in his usual manner. He pulled Willie's clothes from off the clothesline and handed them to him. I'm too hot for socks, he muttered. Leave them off. I can't go out without me socks cried Willie in alarm. Please, Mr. Tom, I can't. Why? Tom snorted. Me legs, he whispered. He didn't want everyone to see the marks of his sins. Tom sighed. He cleared the breakfast things and left Willie with a small addressed postcard that he'd been provided with to write a message on for his mother. Willie sat dejectedly at the table and watched Tom drag his small mattress past the window. He lowered his head. He was so ashamed. He hadn't meant to wet himself. "'How are you getting on?' asked Tom, leaning through the window. Willie jumped and flushed hotly. "'You can't think of what to say, that it?' Tom took the pencil from Willie's hand and turned the postcard towards him. "'Are you happy here?' Willie looked up quickly and nodded. "'Yeah. Arrived safely. Is happy and—' Mr. Mr. Tom, said Willie, interrupting him, you, you were going to tell her I was bad? No, he said, and carried on writing. Here, listen to this. Uh, dear Mrs. Beach, William, she, she don't, don't call me that, she calls me Willie. He altered the word. Willie has arrived safely, is happy and good. Yours sincerely, Mr. Thomas Oakley. There, now, write your name. Willie paled. I, I can't. Didn't they have school in London? Yeah, but... And he trailed off. Well, how about reading? You can read, can't you? No. Tom scratched his head. This boy was eight, so he said. He glanced down at the label on the table to check. William Beach, born September 7th, 1930. Nine on Thursday, he remarked. Your birthday's in five days' time. Anyways, he continued, how does your schooling? Didn't your teacher help you? Yeah, but, well, he, he didn't like me. The others all called me Silly Sissy Willie. What others? Well, at, at school. Well, what about your friends? Oh, I, I, I ain't got no friends. Tom gave a snort and signed a postcard. He noticed Willie looking at the black box on the stool. Pick up that box, William, and bring it over here. Willie did so. Lift the lid, then. 
He raised the lid and gazed at the brightly coloured pots. Paints? he inquired. Tom grunted in the affirmative. You paint? Willie's face fell. He longed to paint. He touched one of the pots gently with his hand and then hastily took it away. Tom straightened himself. Well, we best post your card. Mustn't worry your mum. Climb out. And he helped Willie through the window. They carried on to the foot of the garden, where there was a small, neat wooden gate. They turned left down a road, and after a few paces, Tom opened another gate into the field next to the graveyard. A large cart horse stood drowsily eating something in the grass. Willie hung back. She won't hurt you, said Tom. You walk alongside of me. To Willie's relief, they eventually reached the safety of the gate at the other end of the field. Let's see you shut it now, William. Willie hurriedly closed it with a crash. Put the bolt through. He did so. Good. Willie stood stunned for a moment, for he'd never been praised by anyone ever. The lane they were standing in was bordered by two rows of trees. Tom pushed at an old wooden gate, and after a struggle it creaked and groaned open on its one rusty hinge. They walked into a wild and unkempt garden. Tom knocked at the front door, but there was no reply. He walked round the side of the cottage to the back garden. Leaning back in a wicker chair sat Dr. Oswald Little, a plump, red-faced man. His wife Nancy, a tall, thin, freckled woman with closely cropped iron-grey hair, was digging a large trench in the garden. A cigarette dangled in her mouth. "'Dr. Little,' said Tom loudly. The doctor looked up. Uh, "'Hello, Tom. This is a surprise. You can't be ill.' "'No.' He glanced briefly down at Willie. Nancy, noticing how scared he was, took the cigarette out of her mouth. "'Ah, Mrs. Little,' she said hoarsely, "'I expect you'd like an orange juice, yes?' He nodded and followed her through the back door into the kitchen. Tom sat down. Uh, "'What's the problem?' asked the doctor. "'The boy, is it?' "'Been sick twice already. He had a good tuck-in last night, but brung it up. "'Malnutrition,' the doctor remarked. "'All that good food might have been too much of an assault on his stomach. "'Clear broth, rest, exercise, and milk to begin with. "'I, uh, I expect he's bedwetting, too, hmm?' "'Tom looked surprised. Oh, "'It's quite common. Give him a month or two to settle. "'How old is he? Five, six? Eight? Going on nine. It was the doctor's turn to look surprised. There's someone else. The boy's had a bit of a whipping like. He got bruises and sores all over him. Done with a belt buckle, mostly. He's too shamed to let folks see. If you could manage to have a look. This and warm salt water, croaked a refined voice from behind. It was Mrs. Little. She placed a bottle of witch hazel by his feet. We exchanged battle scars, she explained. I noticed his before we went indoors. I've given him a couple of garters for his socks. Uh, you'd think I'd given him the moon. Tom called Willie and Sam. They carried on to the end of the lane and walked onto the road and into the sunlight. The road brought them to the centre of two rows of thatched cottages. Mrs. Fletcher and a neighbour were standing outside one. It was one of the few cottages which housed a wireless. A small crowd were gathered in and around the garden, listening to it. "'You go and post your card,' said Tom. "'The post office is near the shop. I'll meet you there.' And he left Willie and headed towards the group of listeners. "'Looking for the post office, dear?' said an old lady. "'You be standing right at it.' Willie opened the door and stepped in. He found himself in a room, at the end of which was a small counter with a piece of netting above it. Standing next to the netted window was a young boy. He was leaning on a wooden sill, writing intently. A young man in his twenties was sitting behind the netting, talking to him. "'They'll never read that,' he said. "'That's too small.' "'Yes, they will,' the boy replied. It was the boy's appearance more than anything which attracted Willie's attention. He was taller than him, but at a guess, about nine years old. His body was wiry and tanned, 
and he had a thick crop of black curly hair which looked badly in need of cutting. Willie could not take his eyes off him. "'Can I help you, son?' said the postmaster. Willie blushed and slit his card across the counter. The man glanced down at it. "'Stand, Mr. Oakley, eh? Well, you'll have to watch your P's and Q's there.' The strange boy looked aside at Willie. He smiled, taking in Willie's crumpled grey shorts and jersey. Willie turned quickly away and walked out of the door. Tom was standing on the stone steps of the shop at the corner, waiting for him. "'Come on, William,' called Tom sharply. "'Don't dither, we've got to go into town.' The horse Dobbs clopped slowly past cornfields and cottages, bees and cream-coloured butterflies. Tom and Willie sat in the front of the cart. They halted at a blacksmith's. Tom stepped down and lifted Willie after him. They left Dobbs there and walked towards the shops. Outside a newsagent's were two placards. Poland invaded, read one, and turn your wireless low, read the other. Hot, ain't it? said a tiny old lady from behind the counter. Your usual, is it, Mr. Oakley? she added. Tom nodded. She reached up to a yellow tin of tobacco on one of the shelves. A pile of comics caught Willie's eyes. Tom glanced at him. One Sweden, one comic. Jews. Willie was stunned. Well, don't you worry, Sonny, said the old lady kindly. Would you like sweet or a lolly? Willie swallowed hard. He'd never been asked to choose anything ever. Uh, uh, a lolly, please, miss, he said at last. What flavour? He frowned. Strawberry, he answered huskily. The old lady opened the jar and handed one to him. No, what comic would you like, dear? Willie felt hopeless. What use would a comic be to him? He glanced up at Tom. Uh, uh, I can't. I can't read, Mr. Tom. Well, I know that, but I can, after your Bible. Willie turned back to look at the comics, so that he missed the surprised expression on Tom's face. He at last chose a comic with his suite, and Tom paid for them. It was his first comic. Get moving, boy, barked Tom's voice behind him. I got a list of things a mile long for the drapers. The draper's shop was piled high with rolls of materials. A smartly dressed middle-aged man with a moustache that twirled into a curl at either side of his mouth was cutting a piece of cloth at a high wooden counter. Oh, good morning, Mr. Oakley, he said cheerfully. Black's all right, are they? Tom grunted in the affirmative. A sound of light organ music came from a large wireless at the end of the counter. Oh, for the latest news... The draper explained. Oh, that Chamberlain's so slow. We're ready for Hitler. I say, let's get on with it and stop this shilly-shallying. Suddenly he noticed Willie. Mm, the boy's with me, said Tom quickly. I brung a list from Mrs. Fletcher for materials. He's um, only got what he's standing up in. The draper beamed. Oh, pleasure, Mr. Hoatley. I'll have to measure him myself. He flicked the long tape measure from around his neck. Willie craned his head over the counter and watched him measuring and cutting two rolls of grey and navy flannel. A roll of corduroy lay at the end of the counter. He reached out and touched it. Tom caught sight of him. Uh, well, might as well bring out several colours of that corduroy. Uh, two colours you can have, William. Take your choice. The draper laid out rows of green, brown, rust, navy, grey, and red. Willie eyed Tom's green trousers. He pointed to the green roll, and after a pause, to the navy. Next door was a shoe shop. Boots, Tom said, indicating Willie's feet. Leather's a bit stiff at first, said Tom, as Willie stood up in a solid pair of brown ankle boots. But we'll get some linseed oil to soften them up. A huge lump seemed to burn Willie's chest. It slowly rose into his throat. 
Are, are they f for me? he asked. Well, they ain't for me, answered Tom shortly. They stepped off the pavement outside and crossed over to another group of shops that curved around the square. The heat was stifling. Tom felt a tug at his trouser leg. What is it? Willie was pointing to a tiny corner shop down the small road they'd just crossed. In the front window was a display of paintbrushes which were arranged in a fan. Tubes and coloured pots and boxes were scattered below. Tom's heart sank. He hadn't been in the shop since the day after Rachel had died. It was her favourite place. For forty years he hadn't been able to bring himself to venture into it again. Well, what about it, William? asked Tom quietly. You wants to take a look? Willie nodded feverishly. Only the window, mind. There were boxes of coloured crayons and wax, lead pencils and paints and colours Willie never knew existed. Large, empty pads of white paper lay waiting to be filled in. He looked lovingly at the paintbrushes. Tom stood behind him and stared over his head into the shop. He turned abruptly away, and Willie followed him up the lane and back onto the main street. They stopped outside a library. "'Best join,' said Tom. "'If you's going to stay, that is.' A tall, thin, angular woman in her thirties sat behind a table. "'I've come to join him up,' said Tom, indicating Willie. "'He's with me.' Miss Amelia Thorne gazed at Willie, stared at Tom, and then took another look at Willie. "'With you?' she asked in astonishment. "'But you're—' she was about to say, a bad-tempered, frosty old—' but she stopped herself. "'I'm what?' asked Tom. "'You're so busy.' "'Too busy,' she thought. He never helped or joined in any of the village activities, and had ignored all the signs that a war was approaching. "'We ain't got all day,' said Tom sharply. "'I'll leave the boy here. I've got shopping to do. Let him choose two with pictures, and—' Tom paused for an instant. He never liked asking anyone favours. "'Yes,' said Miss Thorne. "'Choose one that you think would be suitable for me to read to him like. He, he ain't learnt yet.' He cleared his throat awkwardly. Um, <clears throat> one <clears throat> has to do one's duty, don't one? Yes, of course, Mr. Oakley, Miss Thorne replied hastily. Outside, Tom glanced down at the tiny alleyway where the artist's shop stood. Forty-odd years, he muttered, staring into its window. Is that how long it is? He paused for an instant and then stepped inside. Back in the library, Willie felt a hand touch his shoulder. It was Tom. Ready to go now? he said quietly. M Mr. Tom, Willie asked timidly, will you help me? He looked down at the book on his lap. Yes, said Tom. I spread I can talk to Mrs. Hartridge and ask what you need to practice. Tom picked up Willie's three books and gave them to him to carry. The one Miss Thorne had chosen was Rudyard Kipling's Just So Stories. It's not very educational, I'm afraid, Mr. Oakley. Did I say I wanted something educational? Uh, no, Mr. Oakley. Well, don't put words in my mouth. No, Mr. Oakley. And she suppressed a smile. What an odd couple, she whispered to herself after they had left. Wait till I tell May. When they got back, Tom put the blacks up, lit the lamps, and began unpacking the parcels. "'These are pyjamas, William,' he said, lifting up two blue and white striped garments. "'You wear them in bed.' "'Pyjamas,' 
repeated Willie. They returned to the front room, and after a light tea of eggs and toast, Willie changed for bed and positioned himself by the armchair next to Tom. He sat in his crisp new pyjamas. This odd suit felt very strange. Mr. Tom, uh, ain't you gonna read from the Bible? Or don't you like it from me, Ed, then, like last night? Yeah, said Willie. Yeah, I, I did. C can I have Noah's Ark again? Tom related the tale for the second time, and followed it with the daring exploits of Picos Bill from the comic Willie had chosen. After a cup of cocoa, they carried the mattress upstairs between them. Tom placed a rubber sheet on it and made the bed over it. There, he said when they had finished. You can wet the bed till kingdom come. Mr. Tom, whispered Willie, ain't you angry with me? No, he grunted. When I first had Sammy, he paid all over the blemin place. He turned down the blankets, and Willie climbed in between the sheets. He was exhausted. He was just thinking about the boy in the post office when he fell instantly into a deep sleep. Morning, said Tom, appearing at the trap door. Willie opened his eyes and looked around. Morning, he answered. So you slept in the bed last night, good. Willie gave a tight smile, which faded rapidly when he realized that the trousers of his new striped suit were soaking. Oh, never mind about them sheets and jammers. I've got a tub of hot water waiting for them. They stripped the bed between them and carried the sheets downstairs. Tom gently washed Willie's body again and smoothed witch hazel onto the sore spots. An assortment of clothes were lying on the table. Mrs. Fletcher had brought them round the previous night. Tom handed Willie a white shirt from the pile and tied one of his own ties around his neck. He handed him a new pair of grey woolen socks, and Willie pulled the garters over them. It was Sunday. Tom had to be in the church early to see Mr. Peters, the vicar. He went on ahead while Willie staggered on after him. He found the back door of the church already open, and Mr. Tom talking to a tall, lanky man. "'Ah, oh, William!' he exclaimed, turning towards him. "'Mr. Oakley tells me that you're going to give us a hand. Now, those are the hymn books,' he continued, indicating a pile of red books on a table by the main door. "'You put four on each bench. Now, do you think you can do that?' Willie nodded. "'Good!' Willie walked over to the table and picked up some books, feeling totally bewildered. Mum had said red was an evil colour, but the vicar had told him to put them out, so it couldn't be a sin. He'd also said that he was good. Mum had told him that whenever he was good she liked him, but that when he was bad she didn't. Neither did God or anyone else, for that matter. It was very lonely being bad. He was arranging the books in the back row when two boys entered. They were both three or four years older than him. They sat on the choir benches. Suddenly it occurred to Willie that the church would soon be filled with people. He hated crowds and dreaded the Sunday service and its aftermath, which was usually a good whipping. He felt a hand on his shoulder. It was Mr. Tom. Willie gratefully followed him into one of the pews. Within minutes, the tiny church was flooded with men, women, and children. A hacking cough from the porch heralded the arrival of Nancy Little and the doctor. Willie gave a short gasp. She was wearing trousers to church. But the vicar only smiled and shook her hand. He was surprised to see Miss Thorne behind them. "'Mr. Tom,' he whispered urgently, tugging at his sleeve, to set put Lady Livia? Tom nodded. A short, dumpy woman in her front looked at her. That's her sister, Miss May, he said in a low voice. Mrs. Hartridge and her uniformed husband entered. Willie gazed at her, quite spellbound. She was beautiful, he thought. When everyone was reasonably settled, 
Mr. Peters stood in front of the congregation and clasped his hands. Good morning. Now, I know we've several denominations gathered here today, especially amongst our new visitors, who I hope will be happy and safe inside our homes. And now, if you'd all open your hymn books at number 85, we shall sing, Lead Thou Me On. Mr. Bush, the young headmaster of the village school, gave an introductory chord. Light, Willie heard Tom whisper. Go on, light. Willie did so, and soon picked up the melody until he almost began to enjoy it. The hymn was followed by a passage from the New Testament and some simple prayers. The vicar looked at his watch and walked towards the wireless. All eyes were riveted on him. The wireless crackled for a few moments until, after much jiggling with the knobs, the voice of Mr. Chamberlain became clear. I am speaking to you from the cabinet room at 10 Dining Street. This morning the British ambassador in Berlin handed the German government a final note stating that unless we heard from them by eleven o'clock that they were prepared at once to withdraw their troops from Poland, a state of war would exist between us. I have to tell you now that no such undertaking has been received, and that consequently this country is at war with Germany. A few people gave a cry. The rest remained frozen. Finally, Mr. Peters turned the wireless off. After what seemed an interminable silence, he spoke. Let us pray. After the service, when everyone had filed outside, Willie looked around for the strange curly-haired boy that he'd seen at the post office, but there was no sign of him anywhere. "'Go and put the cattle on!' Tom yelled. "'I've got to see the vicar!' Willie turned quickly and stumbled hurriedly down the path. Willie tried vainly to lift the kettle off the range, but... Having only succeeded in burning his hand, he waited anxiously for Mr. Tom's return. When he came, a short, stocky, middle-aged man with a twinkle in his eyes was with him. Willie blushed. "'Come on in, Mr. Fletcher,' said Tom brusquely. They sat down at the table and talked. "'Oh, yeah, he'll manage all right,' Willie heard Tom say. "'Have to muck in like the rest of us.' He glanced in his direction. William, you'll have to get your hands dirty today. We're going to dig a trench for the Anderson shelter. Yes, Mr. Tom, said Willie. Mr. Tom, he asked after Mr. Fletcher had left, what about me clothes getting dirty? Why, you can take your shirt off. It's a good hot day. Willie shuffled nervously on the stool. Well, what's up now? Tom said curtly. Them bruises, is it? Willie nodded. Well, wear your grey jersey then, mind. You'll be dripping. After a meal of meat and potato stew, Mr. Fletcher returned accompanied by his two teenage sons. Willie was given a small spade, and soon he began to forget that he was surrounded by strangers and became absorbed in his digging. In the middle of digging, they all sat down for a mug of tea. Suddenly, Willie gave a start. Footsteps and the sound of a boy's voice were approaching the hedge. Maybe it was the post office boy. The brown-haired choir boy and his younger brother leaned over the gate. "'May I ask your worms, Mr. Oakley?' inquired the choir boy. Tom grunted. "'Dare say you can, George. Come on in.' "'Thanks, Mr. Oakley,' he said enthusiastically. In his hands was a large tin. He walked over to the trench and began scrutinising the piles of earth. Willie watched him in horror as he picked up the wriggling worms and put them inside the tin. Within minutes he was helping with the digging. "'You's one of them towners, ain't you?' he said to Willie. Willie nodded. When the trench was completed, 
Willie sat on the grass to watch the others fix the Anderson shelter inside it. Sammy lay by his feet. "'William,' said Tom, after the Fletchers had left, "'I'm afraid we ain't quite finished yet. You got any strength left?' Willie nodded. Between them they started to cover the shelter with earth until it was time for Tom to leave for a meeting in the village hall. "'Don't carry on for long,' he said, as he swung the back gate behind him, but Willie continued to pile the earth on, levelling it down with his hands. He was so absorbed in his task that he didn't notice dusk approaching. He was in the middle of smoothing one piece of earth when a shadow fell across his hands. He looked up quickly, and there, half silhouetted in the twilight, stood the wiry, curly-haired boy he had seen at the post office. Hello, he said brightly, grasping Willie's hand. There was a loud squelching of mud as he shook it. Oh, sorry, gasped Willie in embarrassment. The strange boy grinned and wiped it on the seat of his shorts. You're William Beach, aren't you? Willie nodded. Pleased to meet you. I'm Zacharias Wrench. Oh, said Willie. Yes, I know. It's a mouthful, isn't it? My parents have a cruel sense of humour. I'm called Zack for short. I say, can I help? I'd like to. Willie was quite taken aback at being asked. I'm rather good at it, actually, he continued proudly. I've given a hand at the creation of several. I wouldn't mess it up. Uh, yes, yeah, replied Willie quietly. If you want. Thanks. I say, I'll show you around. Do you like exploring? Willie shrugged his shoulders. Uh, I, I don't know. Is it your first visit to the country? But before Willie could reply, the boy was already chattering on. It's not mine exactly. I've had odd holidays with friends, my parents, but this is the first time I've actually sort of lived in the country. I've read books that are set in the country, and, of course, poems. He stopped. You've not been here long, have you? he asked. Willie shook his head. You're different. Willie raised his head nervously. Am I? Yes, I sensed that as soon as I saw you. There's someone who's a bit of a loner, I thought. An independent sort of a soul, like myself, perhaps. Willie felt quite tongue-tied. You're living with Mr. Oakley, aren't you? He nodded. He's a bit of a recluse, I believe. What? said Willie. A recluse, you know, keeps himself to himself. Oh, I expect you think I'm a bit forward, remarked Zack. What? F forward, you know. But you see, my parents work in the theatre, and I'm so used to moving from town to town that I can't afford to waste time. As soon as I see someone I like, I talk to them. Willie almost dropped the clod of earth he was holding. No one had ever said that they liked him. It came as quite a shock to Tom to enter the brightly lit village hall. There were far more people than he had anticipated, and the buzz of excited chatter was quite deafening. He attempted to stand inconspicuously in a corner, but it was useless, for most of the villagers nudged one another and turned to stare in his direction. Tom, as Zack said, kept himself to himself. Since his wife Rachel's death, he hadn't joined in any of the social activities in Little Weirworld. Mr. Peters talked about the King's message on the wireless for those who had missed it, and Mr. Thatcher spoke about the procedure of action during an air raid. Mr. Bush announced that Mrs. Black had agreed to help at the school as there would be an extra seventy children attending. She was a quietly spoken old lady who had been retired for seven years. Mr. Thatcher stood up to talk about fire-watching duties. 
No one is allowed to do more than forty-eight hours a month, he said. Just a couple of hours a day. Tom raised his arm. Mr. Peters looked towards the back of the hall in surprise. Yes, Tom? he asked. I'm volunteering, like, he said. I beg your pardon, said Mr. Thatcher in amazement. I'll do the two hours a day, early in the morning or tea time, and I can't leave the boy alone at night. But no, no, I, I, of course not. And his name was hurriedly put down. A tall, angular figure stood up. It was Amelia Thorne. Put mine there too, and while I'm about it, anyone who would like to join our amateur dramatics group is very welcome. Meetings now on Thursdays. It was pitch dark when Tom stepped out of the hall. He opened his little back gate and peered around in the dark for the shelter. William, William, where is you? Here, Mister Tom," said a voice by his side. Tom squinted down at him. And you got sense enough to go indoors? You'll catch cold in that wet jersey. It was my idea," said a cultured voice. "To keep at it." Who's that? Asked Tom sharply.、Uh, me, Mister Oakley. Tom screwed up his eyes to look at Zack. I persuaded Will to partake of my company for a while. Who's Will? Asked Tom bluntly. My name for William.、Uh, he told me he was called Willie, but I thought that was a jolly awful thing to do to anyone. I mean, it's almost as bad as Zacharias Wrench. What? Said Tom. Zacharias Wrench.、Uh, th that's me, Zack for short. Oh, must come in," said Tom at last. They clattered into the hallway. After Tom had made a pot of tea, they sat near the range and surveyed each other. Willie's face, hair, and clothes were covered in fine earth. His filthy hands showed up starkly against the white mug he was holding. Zack, Tom discovered. Was a voluble, curly-haired boy, a few months older than Willie. You finished the shelter, then," said Tom. Willie nodded and glanced in Zack's direction.、Uh, he helped. Well, by the feel of it, you've done a good job. Where are you staying, then? You went from round here,、uh, with Doctor and Missus Little. I've been here for about a week now. Oh," said Tom. I haven't seen you around. Zack glanced at the clock on the bookcase and stood up. I say, it's it's nine o'clock.、Uh, thanks awfully for the tea, Mister Oakley. May I come round tomorrow and see Will? What's up to William? Ask him. Can I? Said Zack earnestly. I've a marvelous idea for a game. Yeah. Wizard, Calu Calay. William, see your friend out. Willie watched Zack walk down the path and towards the church. He stepped back into the hall and felt his way to the living room. In front of the range stood the large copper tub. Tom was pouring hot water into it, while Sam was hiding under the table and eyeing it suspiciously. "Don't worry, Sam, and in for you." He looked down at Willie. "You'll be stiff tomorrow. Best have a good soak." Willie stared in horror at the bubbling water and back towards the table. "Come on, then," said Tom. Willie swallowed.、Oh, no, "Please, Mister, I can't swim. I'll, I'll drown." "And you never." But he stopped himself. It was a stupid question. "You don't put your head under. You sit in it, washes yourself, and has a little lean back." It took some time before Willie allowed himself to relax in the water. Tom handed him a large square bar of soap and showed him how to use it. He then proceeded to wash Willie's hair several times with such vigor that Willie thought his head would fall off. After this ordeal, Tom left him to have a soak, and slowly Willie began to unwind. Tom handed him a towel. And after he'd had his hair rubbed and combed and put his pajamas on, he sat down by the armchair, while Tom sat ready to tell him a story.
This is the story of how God created the world. Willie lay in bed that night, tired and aching, but the aches were very pleasant ones. The next morning they peered into the shelter. Water, murmured Tom. I might have known we'll have to keep a stirrup pump close by. They were leaning over the shelter when Zack arrived. Can Will come out and play? He's already out, isn't he? Yes, I suppose he is, said Zack thoughtfully. It's a figurative expression that I haven't really given a lot of thought to. Where do you get all your queer words from? Are they queer? Well, they ain't normal. So I've been told often and oft, and he gave a sigh. Tom turned at the sound of the back gate opening. A rather disgruntled-looking George walked towards them. Mr. Oakley, me and the twins is going blackberry in like and taking a picnic. He glanced quickly at Willie. Would William like to come with us? Mum says she's making enough for us all. I say, said Zack, can I come? I'd bring some food too. George stared at him in horror. He sighed inwardly. These townies were queer folk, he thought. They talked different. Their ways were odd. All right. What else could he say? He knew the twins would be furious with him. Oh, thanks, said Zack. Where shall I meet you? Outside the shop, in an hour's time. Right ho. From the moment Zack and Willie joined the others, it was obvious that the twins were sulking. George mumbled incoherently to them. This is Will, said Zack, introducing him to the two girls. I'm Carrie, said the one in the sky-blue dress. And I'm Ginny said the one in the lemon colour. Hello, said Willie huskily. George cleared his throat. Well, suppose we best get started. Willie held an empty bucket and a small bag, while Zack carried a basket and satchel. They walked on behind the others. They veered round a corner and came to a large field. The girls walked off in one direction to some hedges on the far side, leaving George with Willie and Zack. "'Who's in the doghouse, then?' asked Zack. "'You or us?' George gave a smile. "'Come with me. I'll find you a good spot.' He pointed to some bushes. "'You see them red berries?' "'Oh, rather,' said Zack. "'They look delumptious.' "'Do you what?' "'Delumptious. That's a mixture of... Delicious and scrumptious. Well, anyways, continued George, undaunted by Zack's interruption. Them's poisonous. Look, there's a good un, he said, pointing to a hedgerow dripping with blackberries. You pick there. An hour later, after scratching their arms and legs and staining their hands and mouths with juice, they sat down in the grass and passed a bottle of lemonade around. The girls looked a little less sulky and stared at the two townies. "'How'd you do that?' asked Carrie, pointing to Willie's leg. He paled for an instant, thinking perhaps that his socks had slid down. But they hadn't. She was referring to the graze on his knee. "'I fell,' he whispered. They returned to the bushes to pick more berries, staying a little closer to each other. Slowly they started to talk, except for Willie, who only listened. He learned that Carrie liked reading books, climbing trees and exploring, that Ginny liked knitting and sewing, and that they both liked swimming. George was keen on fishing, and his mother had on three occasions cooked fish that he had caught. He also played cricket and swam. Zack said he liked acting and reading adventure books and poetry. He also liked swimming and cycling. He said that he wrote stories, though he had to admit that he'd never got further than the first two pages. Will, Zack said, suddenly entering into his silence, what do you like? 
Willie tried to think of something to say. He couldn't do anything. He began to panic. Then he relaxed a little as he remembered something. I, I like drawing. Could you draw me? asked Zack. Well, I don't know. I could have a go. I'm starving, said George, interrupting the conversation. Let's eat. They gathered together under a tree and spread the food out. For Willie, it was his first taste of chocolate cake, scones, and fruit pie. On the way home, Willie felt as if his arms would surely come out of his sockets with the weight of the berries. After George had left his basket at home, he gave Willie a hand. He felt so ashamed of his weakness, but George didn't ridicule him at all. He seemed pleased to help. Willie spent the evening with Tom, washing and bottling the blackberries and eating some of them for supper. He sank into an even deeper sleep that night with the knowledge that he, Willie Beach, had survived a whole day with four other people of his own age, and he had made jam. Side two. At the village school, Mr. Bush and Mrs. Hartridge were talking to an elderly lady. That's Mrs. Black, whispered Ginny. She must be the extra teacher. Mr. Bush dealt with the older children first and placed a few evacuees with them at the back. It was very noisy. George, Carrie, and Ginny were to be in Mrs. Hartridge's class again. She was taking the eight to eleven-year-olds. Willie watched Mrs. Hartridge approach him and Zack. Zack told her his age, which was nine, and spelt out his name, apologizing for it at the same time. She smiled. Willie handed her his label and said nothing. Suddenly his heart fell. She leaned over to Zack and said, Now, Zacharias, tell me, you can read and write, can't you? At this juncture, Willie's ears filled up. Zack's chattering was only a faint rumbling echo in the distance. He felt her hand on his shoulder. Now, William, how about you? Can you read and write? No, he answered, and stared at the floorboards, wishing he could disappear into them. Oh, I'm sorry about that, William. I would have liked you in my class. You'll have to go and sit with... Mrs. Black's class, and she pointed to the little ones seated on the floor. Willie rose as if in a daze, found a space on the floor, and sat down. He felt utterly humiliated. Back at the cottage, Tom pushed a mug of tea towards him. How was it, then? Willie scraped the toes of his boots together. Bad, was it? Willie nodded. Best tell me, then. He raised his head. It was difficult to look at Tom without his lips trembling. I'm... I'm with the babies. Oh, and whose class is Zacharias in, then? Mrs. Hartridge's. Why ain't you? Well, he can read. And write. Oh, and the ones that can't are with Mrs. Black, that it? Yeah, mm, I see. Tom stood up. We'll begin this evening, he said sharply. That do? What? Learning to read and write. Willie's eyes stung. He beamed. Oh, mister, was all he could manage to say. Tom was surprised to find a lump in his own throat. Uh, you go and have a run with Sammy, he growled huskily. I'll get some supper. After supper had been cleared, Tom put a piece of paper and a pencil in front of him. On the paper were several straight lines, and in between each pair was a series of dots. Now, William, said Tom, 
you just join up the dots from the top downwards, and when you've done that, easily written your name. Now, just taste your own time. Willie placed the lead onto the paper and slowly followed the dots down and up, down and up, making the letter W. He sat back and looked at it. It's bad, isn't it? Ain't it, Mr. Tom? Tom peered at it. He was surprised. No, he said with honesty. No, it ain't. Isn't it? Willie queried. No, he repeated. He's doing fine. Willie returned to the dots, and apart from the occasional wobble, he wrote William in a remarkably smooth hand. Oh, that's good, said Tom. Mr. Tom, I, I can look at my name and, and draw it. Is, is writing like drawing? Well, I don't think so. You show me what you mean. Willie found a clean, unlined space, looked at what he'd done, drew two straight lines, and wrote William in between them. Those lines are almost straight, gasped Tom. Where have you learned to do that? Well, nowhere. I just looked at him and, and done it. Well, that's very good, remarked Tom. Is it? Well, you've just written your name, boy. Have I? And he stared down at the letters. Tom made him point to the letters going from left to right, sounding out each one. Well, you picked that up very quick, very quick. Well, it's, it's copying, though, isn't it? Well, yes, I suppose so. Mr. Tom, said Willie after some thought, isn't that bad? What, copying? Yeah. Well, not when you're learning, said Tom. Mr. Tom, does that mean if, if I copy, I won't go to hell? Hell? said Tom in amazement. Don't be daft, boy. Whatever put such a thought in your head? Willie leapt out of bed. It was the beginning of his sixth day in Little Weirworld. He'd only just disappeared for a run with Sammy down the graveyard path when the postman arrived at the back gate. "'Birthday boy, is it?' said young Matthew Parfit. "'Anything from London?' asked Tom. Matthew shook his head. "'Afraid not. I got parcels, though, and cards.' Tom took the cards and parcels indoors. It was a shame that there was nothing from the boy's mother. He hurried into the front room. Willie returned, flushed and breathless, followed by Sammy. He flung open the door and was about to say something when he caught sight of the table. Surrounding Willie's place were parcels and envelopes. "'Happy birthday,' said Tom. Uh, "'Are they for me?' he asked in astonishment. "'What is where you usually sit, and it? Oh, go on, open them.' Willie picked up a soft brown paper package and with trembling fingers slowly untied the string. Inside lay a green woolen balaclava, a green sleeveless pullover, and a pair of navy blue corduroy shorts. Like to try em on? said Tom. Willie climbed out of his thin grey ones and stepped into the navy pair. Tom fixed the braces onto them. He put the pullover on over Willie's shirt. Stand back and let's have a look at you. Willie beamed. Feel good, do they? Yeah, I got pockets too, he said, plunging his hands deep into them. He glanced at the balaclava. What was that? What is a balaclava? Keeps your head and ears warm when the wind's nippy. The next parcel contained some chill-proof underwear from May Thorne. Amelia, her sister, had given him an illustrated copy of The Wind in the Willows. Inside she'd written, To William on his ninth birthday. Willie held it tightly to his chest. Is it for me to keep? Tom nodded. His own book. His very own book. He stared at the gifts, quite speechless. 
Tom, meanwhile, took a large parcel out of the cupboard and placed it in front of him. Well, that's me present from me to you. Willie unwrapped the parcel and gave a start. There, before his eyes, lay one large and one small sketch pad. Pages and pages of untouched paper. There were two paintbrushes and three pots of paint. The paints were red, yellow, and blue. If you mix them, you can also get orange, green, and brown. Wrapped up in tissue paper were a pencil, a rubber, and a sharpener. Willie swallowed a pain that had risen at the back of his throat. I take it you like em, murmured Tom. I choose em myself like. Since Rachel's death, he'd never wanted to touch anything that might remind him of her. Trust a strange boy to soften him up. Thanks, Mr. Tom, said Willie huskily. I'll, I'll look after them real proper. After school, Willie couldn't wait to begin drawing, but for some reason Tom wanted him out of the cottage. Willie had hardly stepped outside when it started to rain. Well, how about the church? Tom exclaimed suddenly. You could draw in there. Yeah, agreed Willie. Yeah, I could. It felt odd to be left alone in the church. He stared up at the windows and then caught sight of the pulpit. He placed the sketch pad on his knees, flicked open the first page, and began to draw. Sometime later the door opened and Zack peeped in. He had never seen the interior of a church before. He slipped quietly in and glanced around. He took a few paces forward and leaned over Willie's small, thin shoulders. His shadow fell across the pad. Willie jumped and turned round hurriedly, placing his arm over the picture, but it was too late. Zack had already seen it. "'I say!' he gasped, full of admiration. "'That's magnificent!' Willie shyly flapped the cover of the pad over the drawing. "'Um, um, Mr. Oakley says that he'd like to, um, converse with you. He's, he's waiting for you now.' Is he? said Willie in surprise, and he picked up his Macintosh. Oh, come on, said Zack impatiently. Inside the cottage, Willie hung his Macintosh on his peg. You go in first, said Zack, and with that he pushed open the front room door, and immediately the whole place erupted into Happy birthday to you! Happy birthday to you! Happy birthday, dear William. Happy birthday to you. Oh, 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 oh! The twins, George, their mothers, and Tom were all standing in the front room singing, while Sammy sat in the middle and howled. A large banner with Happy Birthday William on it hung above and across the range. On the table stood jellies, chocolate wafers, a plate of potted meat and fish paste sandwiches, and a plate of fairy cakes. In the centre of the table was an iced cake with nine lighted candles on it. So this was what a birthday party was like, thought Willie. He looked towards Tom for help. Well, you got to blow the candles out, boy. And if you manage to blow them all out at once, you can make a wish said Carrie. Willie leaned over, took a deep breath, and blew. Everyone applauded. They'd all just sat down when Zack suddenly let out a cry. I nearly forgot. You haven't seen Will's picture. Willie's face turned pink. You drawn a picture? asked Tom. I say. Or well, can we see it? said Carrie. He lifted the cover up shyly. George came and stood by his side and gave a low whistle. "'I told you, didn't I?' said Zack. Tom peered down. It was a copy of the carved eagle on the pulpit. Its strong, stubborn wings were swept back in a magnificent curve. Around it Willie had added rain, so that it appeared to be flying against a great wind. 
Well, that's a fine hand you have there, William, said Tom quietly. A fine hand. Willie blushed crimson. They all settled down to eating, while Willie, amidst all the chatter and laughter, found himself an object of praise. After playing several party games, everyone finally returned home. Tom and Willie watched them leaving. Mr. Tom, said Willie, touching his sleeve, it's the best, it, it's the best, but he never finished. The excitement and food simply welled up inside him, and he gave a short gasp and vomited all over the carpet. During the next seven weeks, the leaves floated and twirled from the trees, and a light hoar frost covered the fields in the early mornings. One dull afternoon in October, Zack, Willie, the twins, and George were sitting in Zack's bedroom in the Littles' cottage, waiting for Tom. "'Where is he?' moaned Zack. "'He's taking an age.' There was a loud knocking from downstairs. Zack leapt from his chair. Tom was standing in the hallway, his cap and overcoat covered in a thin layer of drizzle. "'I try to keep it dry,' he said, indicating a large battered suitcase by his feet. "'I'll collect you in thirty minutes, William. Mind you come immediate-like.' Zack and George dragged the old brown leather case up to the bedroom and laid it on one side. Both sides of it were covered in labels of all colours and shapes, with the names of towns and countries on them. "'Has you been to all them countries?' asked George. "'My parents, mostly. They used this when they were one night standing, and eventually they gave it to me.' "'One night standing?' repeated Willie. "'Yes.' Zack leaned back on his heels and looked at Willie. "'Haven't you ever seen a show?' Willie shook his head. Me mum says that theatres and picture houses are dens of sin. Rot! exclaimed Zack. I learn to walk and talk in theatres, and I'm not sinful, am I? You're just an angel, ain't you? said Carrie, her hands clasped. At last the stiff, damp straps of the case were unbuckled. Zack threw back the lid in triumph. An envelope with Zack written on it in bold lettering was stuck to the inside of the lid. "'It's from Mummy and Daddy!' Zack yelled. "'Surprise, surprise!' said George. "'Come on, we've got to go home soon. You can read that later.' The case was packed very tightly. "'Wizzo!' Zack yelled, pulling out an assortment of much-loved and battered objects. "'Books!' Carrie began to flick through them. "'It's all talking,' said Carrie. "'There ain't no description. "'But with a sum in the dialogue,' explained Zack, "'they're plays.' George held up one thick, battered tome. "'The complete works of William Shakespeare. Ugh. "'And he dropped it in disgust. "'How dare you!' cried Zack, picking it up hastily. He looked at Willie. William Shakespeare was one of our greatest playwrights, Will. He wrote plays nearly four hundred years ago, and people still go and see them being performed. Oh, William Shakespeare, Willie repeated. William. So he had the first name of somebody famous. Next, Zack hurriedly unpacked a soft, flat parcel. With a flourish, he pulled out a jersey of many colours, the body and sleeves were knitted in coloured squares, red, yellow, green, black, and orange. He struggled out of his old jersey and put it on. He even had to turn up the sleeves. "'Wonderful, isn't it?' he remarked. 
but the others could only stare at him in speechless amazement. "'You ain't going to wear that, is you?' said George. "'Why ever not?' "'Well, tis a bit bright, isn't it?' Zack turned to Willie. The jersey had a polo-neck collar in red. William thought that next to Zack's deep complexion and black hair, the red looked pleasing. "'Well, oh, I think it's fine,' he said quietly, and Zack knew he was speaking truthfully. He closed the case. "'Where shall we meet tomorrow night?' he asked. "'What's wrong with here?' said Carrie. Zack pointed his thumb downwards. "'There's always something going on here in the evenings.' Willie remained silent. He had a room. It was terribly private and precious, though, and he was still wetting his bed. Zack, he began huskily. He cleared his throat. Um, <clears throat> well, there's my room. Of course, Zack cried. I'd forgotten. Could we meet at your place? Uh, I'll ask Mr. Tom, he said. "'flushing slightly. "'Goodness!' gasped Ginny, "'catching sight of the clock. "'We'll have to go!' "'She, Carrie, and George "'grabbed their coats "'and fled out of the room "'and down the stairs. "'When shall we meet?' "'whispered Zack urgently after them. "'How about Thursday?' "'Choir practice,' said George. "'Friday?' "'Friday was agreed. "'Now,' said Zack, "'jumping onto the bed, I can read my letter, and he pulled out the crumpled envelope from his shorts. There was a knock on the front door. Oh, that's Mr. Tom, said Willie. I've oh, got to go. Oh, bother, said Zack. It wasn't until after he had gone to bed that Willie asked about the room. He took a deep breath. Mr. Tom... Could I have George and Zack and Carrie and Ginny up here in this room? Don't see why not. They've been thrown out of their homes. No, it's just there ain't much room at George's, and Zack says, Well, there's no need to explain. This is your room. You does what you like. When does he wanted to come? Friday. Friday, tis then. He stood up and kissed his forehead. Night, lad he said quietly. Mr. Tom, said Willie as he turned the lamp down. Yes? They don't know about, you know. And he patted the blankets with his hands. All the bedwetting. You weren't ashamed of that, as you? Willie nodded. Well, then, no need to mention it. I'll make your bed up before the evening so they won't see the rubber. That do? Yeah. Ta. They'd cleared supper on Friday evening and were sitting by the range with a cup of tea when the first person to arrive knocked at the front door. "'Well, aren't you going to answer it, then?' said Tom. It was Zack. Willie showed him into the living room where Sammy greeted him, wagging his tail. "'Oh, it's an unusual jersey, that,' commented Tom. It was the first time he had seen Zack's Joseph jersey. "'Unique, I'd say.' replied Zack. Oh, "'I'll go put the blacks up and light the lamps,' said Tom. Willie was pleasantly surprised at Zack's excitement over his room. Two of the walls were covered with his drawings and paintings, and on one wall were shelves that Tom had fixed up for his clothes and treasures. There was a loud knock on the open trapdoor, and Carrie and Ginny's heads came into view. "'Oh, and it beautiful!' commented Ginny. Ah, oh, like a workroom of one's own, sighed Carrie enviously. They clambered up onto the floor, followed eagerly by George, who practically fell over them in his clumsy desire to get in. All three of them stared silently at the walls. You never done these, did you? said George. Sheer genius, aren't they? said Zack, thrusting his nose upwards. Wizard choice of friends I have, don't you think? Now, do sit down, everyone. I've something tremendously important to tell you. Reveal all, then, said Carrie, imitating his theatrical way of speaking. Guess what, 
he half squeaked. Miss Thorne is producing a children's Christmas show for the war effort, and she needs all the help she can get. Ginny gasped. I couldn't go on stage. I'd hate it. Well, you needn't act in it. You could help backstage. You could do your sewing, suggested George. Ginny's face lit up. I could make costumes. Well spoken, that man, said Zack. That's a wizard idea. George beamed. Now, what are you going to do in the show? George's face fell. Me? Me? I ain't doing no fancy theatricals with old corny thorny. Coward, said Carrie. I ain't going to do it, and that's a fact. Zack stared at him intently. Coward, repeated Carrie. All right, said George crossly, but I ain't bass pleased. Wizzo, that's two. What about you, Zack? asked Carrie. Oh, I expect I'll volunteer for one of the leads, he said, leaning back nonchalantly. He turned to Willie. I I ain't been near a theatre, me mum says. You needn't perform. You could help with the scenery. Painting like, said Carrie. He smiled nervously. Yeah, all right. I'll volunteer too, said Carrie. I don't mind what I do. Wizzo, yelled Zack. That's the five of us. My turn now for news, said George. We's gone to have a big carol service in the church on Christmas Eve. And Mr. Bush started rehearsing us last night, and he could do with some extra voices like. Carrie opened her mouth. Boys only, he added. And it a blooming cheek, she exclaimed angrily. Boys gets all the chances, they never even bother to put girls out for the high school. And here's me dying to go. Well, interrupted George, glancing at Willie and Zack. You too interested? I'd like to, said Zack, but it'd be a bit strange if I sing in it, won't it, me not even being a Christian? Isn't you a Christian? asked Willie in alarm. He shook his head. No, well, I thought you knew that. I mean, I'd really like to, but I've already been shouldered out of the nativity play. It's rotten, rotten luck. I know the story quite well, too. I mean, your Jesus, that you believe was God, was Jewish, wasn't he? And here's me dying to act, and I can't be in it, because I am Jewish. Well, now you know how I feel about the high school, said Carrie. Oh, uh, I'll, I'll, I'll do it, said Willie suddenly. Oh, uh, uh, I'll, I'll sing. George beamed. There was a knocking on the hatch. Willie lifted it up to find Tom standing on the steps with a large tray in his hands. On it was a jug of lemonade, five cups, a plate of ginger snaps, and a bowl of nuts. Oh, chestnuts! yelled Willie. But he hasn't been done them when it's Christmas. I see them, set them in the streets lots of times, but I ain't never tasted them like. I thought maybe you could use them. Oh, rather, cried Zack. Mr. Tom, you're a real brick. Am I? Oh, well, well. He's a real decent sort, Will, said Zack when Tom had gone. You're awfully lucky being landed on someone like him. Willie smiled. He'd known that since that first bewildering day. The meeting ended with everyone feeling very satisfied. They scrambled down the ladder, yelling their goodbyes. When Willie woke the next day, there was something altogether unusual about the morning. It was only when he started automatically to strip the bed that he realised what it was that was so different. There was no need for the sheets to be washed that day. They were dry.
November had been a damp and drizzly month. All evacuees had left the village and outlying countryside, except Willie and Zack, Robert and Christine King up at Hillbrook Farm, and the four Brown children at the vicarage. David Hartridge had become a fully-fledged pilot and was looked upon as a hero. His wife was expecting their first child. It was now the first week in December. The show that Miss Thorne was producing was an adaptation of A Christmas Carol by Charles Dickens. Zack was playing Bob Cratchit, Mr. Fezziwig, the ghost of Christmas present, and the ghost of what might be. Carrie was cast to play Mrs. Fezziwig, and the young woman who had fallen in love with the youthful Scrooge. George had been tried out in a variety of parts, but each time he stepped on the stage he would stand with his legs and arms splayed out and drone monotonously. Miss Thorne hit upon the idea of casting him as the ghost of Marley, Scrooge's ex-partner. It would need no acting ability from George. One winter afternoon, while they were rehearsing, something happened which stunned everyone involved in the play. Willie had already helped paint the scenery, but had been asked to take over as prompter. After a while he soon knew large chunks of the play off by heart, and could occasionally prompt without looking at the book. Carrie was the only one on stage. "'Has anyone seen Christine or Robert King?' Miss Thorne asked, turning to the others who were sitting at the back of the hall. "'No, miss,' piped Lucy. Robert was playing Scrooge. Oh, well, "'We'll do the crone scene, then. Christine's in that,' chorused three at the back. "'Oh, so she is,' said Miss Thorne. "'This really is too bad.' She glanced at Willie. "'William, stand in for Christine. We'll just have to have a male crown for today.' William crept nervously on stage. Uh, "'Now, William,' said Miss Thorne. Uh, "'Yes, miss. Imagine that it's very cold and dark, and that you're old and hungry, and that you love stealing and making trouble for people.' Willie looked at her dreamily. "'Did you hear that?' He nodded. Good. Uh, you have the first line. Start when you're ready. Willie withdrew into himself. He remembered an old tramp he used to watch down by the tube station near where he lived. He was hunched, and he dragged his feet when he walked. He also remembered times when he himself was so hungry that he couldn't stand straight for the cramps in his stomach. Miss Thorne watched him grow visibly older. His shoulders were pushed up by his neck, and his stomach caved in. He looked cold and miserable and bad-tempered. Zack found himself totally mesmerized. Then Willie began speaking. His voice was harsh and mean. When the scene came to an end, he shuffled slowly off the stage. "'I say,' whispered Zack, "'you'll say nothing for the moment.' said Miss Thorne. When Miss Thorne finished working on the scene, Willie came and sat beside Zack. "'You're good,' whispered Zack. "'Good? What do you mean?' "'You're a good actor.' Willie didn't understand. All he'd done was to make a picture of someone in his head and worm his way inside it. For the next half hour the rehearsals took on a sudden lift, and Everyone began to dare to try things without feeling foolish. The only thing that spoilt it was the absence of Robert, who was Scrooge. He was in nearly all the scenes. Finally, Miss Thorne told them to take a short break, while she left the hall to make a phone call to Hillbrook Farm. When she returned, her face was pale. Uh, "'Sit down, everyone, please. I'm afraid I've just had some rather bad news.' Robert and Christine's mother came early this morning and took them back to London. It seems she felt they were being used as unpaid labour. This means that we have no Scrooge. Oh, no, cried Zack. Does that mean we can't do it? asked Carrie. Miss Thorne turned to Willie. William, she said quietly, 
I'd like you to play the part of Scrooge. Willie felt an intense tingle pass from his toes to the roots of his hair. Will you? He nodded. Oh, well done, cried Zack. Hip, hip, hooray! And that's enough, interrupted Miss Thorne firmly. We have a lot of work to do. We'll start with Act One, Scene One. Now we must all pull together and help. We'll block the moves first. You take my script and pencil for now, William. She stopped rehearsing when they reached the end of Act One. Well done, William, she said encouragingly. Well done, everyone. You all worked very hard. William, you keep my script and look over the scene we've blocked. The next rehearsal will be on Monday night after school. Willie walked shakily out of the inner door to the porch. Zack was waiting to tell him something when Ginny and Miss Thorne's elder sister burst in. Whatever's the matter, May? asked Miss Thorne. Oh, haven't you heard the news about Mr. Bush? What about him? Has he had an accident? Oh, worse. He's been called up. What about the carol concert? interrupted George. It's on in three weeks' time. Zack and Willie slipped out into the darkness. When Willie arrived home, he found Tom was sitting at the table, gluing coloured paper chains together. He was unusually quiet. Willie suddenly became aware of how pale Tom looked, and he felt alarmed for a moment. Perhaps he was ill. Is you all right? asked Willie, sitting on the stool. You heard about Mr. Bush? Willie nodded. I'd been asked to take over the choir like for the concert. Play the organ. Oh, can you play? Used to when Rachel was alive. Who's Rachel? A gentle hearted, wild young girl I once loved. Where, where's she now? Tom pointed to the window behind with his thumb. She's the one under the oak tree. Died after she had a baby. What, what happened to the baby? Died soon after. Buried together. He glanced at Willie. Same name as yours, too. William? He nodded and gave a deep sigh. It's a long time since I touched that organ. You you can't do it, then? He leant back and paused for a moment. Yes, he said at last, and he glanced across at the table. What's that, then? he asked. New book? Uh, it's a script of Christmas Carol. Oh. What are you doing with it, then? What? Well, I've been asked to be in the play. As you, said Tom, leaning forward. Yeah. I take it you's going to do it then? Willie smiled, his cheeks burning with excitement. Yeah. There were usually fifteen pupils in Mrs. Hartridge's class, ranging from nine to fourteen years of age. On this particular snowy Monday morning, there were only ten present. Willie sat in the front row and shared a double desk with Patsy Finch, a dark-haired, easy-going nine-year-old. Each desk had an inkwell hole and a long groove for pencils and pens. To his left, in another double desk, sat eleven-year-old Fred Padfield and Zack. Mrs. Hartridge sat at a high oak desk. "'I'm sure we would all like to welcome William Beach to our class,' Mrs. Hartridge had said, turning to him. We know what excellent progress you've made and how hard you've worked. Willie had tried to cover his embarrassment by scowling, but the scowl didn't last long. Today we're going to do long multiplication, she went on. George and Frederick, I'd like you to revise your tables. After arithmetic, they had an English language lesson, which was on nouns, Willie turned to look at Zack and saw Carrie passing him a note. Zack glanced surreptitiously at it on his knee. Checking to see if Mrs. Hartridge was looking, he turned back and nodded. K 
Carrie looked a little scared. Pencils and books away. Time for break. Patsy? Patsy was the milk monitor for the week. Slowly, Carrie left her desk and walked up to Mrs. Hartridge's desk. Excuse me, Mrs. Hartridge. Yes, Carrie, she said, surprised. Can I speak to you on your own like it's very important? Now? Carrie nodded. All right, we'll go somewhere private. Thank you, Mrs. Hartridge. When you've all finished your milk, go outside. Zack, Ginny, George and Willie fled into the playground. Where's Carrie? said Ginny. I saw her going up to Mrs. Hartridge. Oh, perhaps they're having a little conflab, said Zack. Well, she would have told me if anything was wrong, said Ginny. Oh, there's nothing wrong, yet, he added mysteriously. Ginny was astounded. Do you mean you know what it's all about? Zack nodded. I'll say I do. But, but I'm her sister. Well, she thought you might try and stop her. Stop her? Stop what? Zack took a deep breath. She's asking if she can take the exam for the high school. She never has, gasped Ginny. She wouldn't dare. She jolly well has. Oh, she's a girl, cried George. I say, is she really? I think it's just fine, said Willie. At lunchtime, Zack grabbed Carrie. What did she say? She says she'll think about it and make inquiries. No girl here has ever done one of four, see, so it ain't yes, and it ain't no. During the first lesson of the afternoon, Mrs. Hartridge read out a passage from Treasure Island and wrote up ten questions on the board for them to answer. When Patsy handed back Willie's book, she stared at him. You got eight out of ten, she said in wonder, and it only your first day. Who has full marks? asked Mrs. Hartridge. Carrie raised her hand and flushed. Mrs. Hartridge smiled. Nine out of ten? Ruth raised her hand. Eight out of ten? Zack and Willie put up their hands. The rest of the class gasped. Well done, she said, and Willie welled with pleasure. And now put away your books. The subjects for you to paint for this afternoon are a rainy day or a rainy night. She turned to Willie. From what I hear, I think you'll be all right on your own. And she gave him another of her heavenly smiles. Oh, one day, thought Willie, I'll draw you real good. Forty minutes later, he raised his paintbrush for a moment and looked up but immediately he resumed painting and grew deaf to his surroundings. Mrs. Hartridge walked down the aisle looking at each person's work. Well, that's very good, Ruth, she said. You're improving, Frederick. Another heroic rescue, Zack, only this time in the rain. Well tried. She glanced down at Willie's painting and gave a start. The painting was set at night in a gloomy back street in a city. An old lamppost stood alight on a corner. Squatting down by a wall was a blind beggar in a shabby raincoat, his white stick lying beside him. His cap lay on the street in front of him, and he stared out with dead, sad eyes. The rain swept across the old man's face, so that his white hair hung limply and rain trickled down his cheeks. That's excellent, William she said quietly. Leave it out to dry. I'd like to put it on the wall. After school, Zack and Willie sauntered slowly homewards and talked endlessly outside the little's dilapidated front gate. Willie's first day in Mrs. Hartridge's class was over.
One Friday morning in the first week of March, Willie looked out of his window to find that the snow had thawed completely. Willie had by now settled happily into his new class. He adored being near Mrs. Hartridge. He loved the way she moved and smiled and the soft cadence of her voice. That Friday evening, he and Zack made their way to the play meeting. Miss Thorne announced that they would be presenting Toad of Toad Hall. Willie sang as he walked home down the lane. He was still bursting with energy. Tom was standing by the range. He glanced at Willie and listened quietly to his chatter. Willie told him about the play, how Zack was playing Toad and he was to play Mole, and that he was meeting Zack the following afternoon. Tom didn't make any comment. Willie looked up and noticed that Tom was holding a letter. Was... "'What's the matter?' "'That's from your mother,' he said, indicating the paper. "'She's ill. She wants you to go back for a while.' He felt someone shaking him to consciousness. "'Hey, stupid, wake up, wake up, lad, this is London. We're in London, wake up!' He swung the rucksack over his shoulder and lifted the carrier bag. As he stepped outside, the cold night air hit him sharply. The platform was swarming with soldiers, but there was no sign of his mother anywhere. The ticket man took one look at Willie and gave a weary sigh. Another runaway, eh? Don't you lads know it's safer in a country? I suppose you've no ticket. Willie pulled a ticket out of his pocket and showed it to him. Oh, he said. Oh. I'm, uh, I'm visiting me mum like she's ill. Ah, oh, ah, oh, I see. Willie looked frantically round the station. Oh, there she is, he said, pointing to a thin, gaunt woman standing next to a pile of sandbags. He waved and yelled out to her, but she stared vacantly around, neither seeing or hearing him. Willie ran over to her. Mum, he cried. Mum! She glanced down and was about to tell him to clear off when she recognised him. Yes, it was Willie, but he'd altered so much. Here stood an upright, well-fleshed boy in sturdy ankle boots, thick woollen socks, a green roll-top jersey and a navy blue coat. His hair was a shiny mass above his forehead and his cheeks were round and pink. It was a great shock to her. I'm awfully pleased to see you, Mum. I've such a lot to tell you, and as me pictures like. She was startled at his peculiar mixture of accents. Even his voice sounded louder. I'm sorry, she said. I'm not very well, you see, and I'm a bit tired. I wasn't expecting such a change in you. He studied her face. She was very pale, almost yellow in colour. A small shopping bag was now leaning against her leg. He touched her arm gently. "'I'll carry that for you, Mum,' he said, picking it up. She spun round and gave his hand a sharp slap. "'I'll tell you what I want, when I want, and you know I don't approve of touching.' Uh, "'Sorry,' he muttered. "'Let's go home for a cup of tea,' she said at last. You can take my bag. Oh, thanks, Mum. And he smiled. She stepped sharply backwards, horrified. She couldn't remember ever having seen him smile before. The smile frightened her. It threatened her authority. Willie followed her down a tiny back alley to a small cafe. They sat near the door. Why, you look more filled out, said his mother. Fed you well, did he, that Mr. Oakley? Willie sipped tea. Yes, yeah, he did. She pointed to his rucksack on the floor. Where'd you get that from? Mr. Tom. Oh, and who's he? Well, uh, Mr. Oakley, he gave it to me to carry the presents. as a present for you, too. I don't need charity, thank you, she said, pursing her lips. You know that. No, it ain't charity. It's for you getting well. 
Mrs Thatcher made you some bed socks. Pink they are, real soft. And Lucy's mum and dad put in eggs and butter. Butter? Yeah. And Mrs Fletcher made a fruitcake. He was talking an awful lot, she thought. Too cheeky by far. She'd soon discipline it out of him. And uh, Aunt Nance, uh, Mrs Little, she has sent a bottle of tonic wine. Mrs Beach turned puce. Wine? she said angrily. Haven't I told you about the evils of drink? Well, it, it ain't like what you buy in, in, in a pub, Mum. I asked. She says it's got iron in it. You haven't changed, have you? I thought that man would frighten some goodness into you, but it seems he hasn't. He was a church man, wasn't he? Oh, yeah, yes, Mum, he, he took care of it. I told you in my letters. Oh, yes, your letters. Now, Willie, I thought you'd grown out of lying. He felt bewildered. That writing was not yours. I know that. But I, I, I learned at school, and Mr Tom and Miss Thorne helped me. My, you do seem to have taken up a lot of people's time. They must be glad to see the back of you. No, no, Mum, they ain't. They, 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 um... They what? Well, they, they like me. It felt so good to say that. That's show, Willie. No, Mum. Mrs Beach tapped the table gently. That's enough for now, Willie. Willie? Nobody had called him that for six months. It was as though she was talking to someone else. He suddenly felt like two people. He knew she wouldn't accept the Will side of him, only the old Willie, and he didn't feel real when she called him that. She leaned towards him. There's something I've been meaning to tell you, Willie, and she forced a smile which for some reason alarmed him. It's a, a little surprise only, she added. Oh, we have to creep into the house. No one must see you. It's, um, it's like a game. Oh, no one must see me. No. Well, why? She frowned and then put on the smile again. You'll see. It's a surprise. He nodded. He didn't really feel sick in his stomach. He was just imagining it, wasn't he? And then you can show me your cake and presents. Yeah, he said, visibly brightening. And I could show you me pictures. They caught a bus which crawled along slowly in the blackout, until at last they reached Deptford. Mrs. Beach led Willie round the back of their street. She told him to hide in an alleyway and watch their front door. As soon as she had opened it and coughed, he was to run in. It was a strange game, thought Willie. He'd not been standing long when he heard the cough. Picking up the rucksack and bags, he dragged them across the pavement. His mother whispered angrily to him to hurry up. He stumbled into the front room, which was still in darkness. There was a strong, dank smell coming from somewhere. It was as if an animal had opened its bowels or peed somewhere. Is it a dog? he asked. Is what a dog? Well, the surprise. Oh, that. No, it's not a dog. She turned the light on. The room was darker than Willie had remembered. In addition to the newspaper over the windows, it was also crisscrossed with brown tape. Willie looked around, and then he saw it. A wooden box on a chair in the corner. He walked over to it and looked inside. He put his hand inside. A baby, he whispered. Uh, why? He stopped and turned. It's got tape on its mouth. I know that. I didn't want her to make a noise while I was out. It's a secret, you see. Is it, um... Is it yours? Ours. What, well, a present? Yes. Who from? Jesus. He glanced down at the baby. 
She was very smelly. She opened her eyes and began to cry. Oh, I'll pick her up, he said, leaning towards her. Don't you dare. But she's crying. She's just trying to get attention. She must learn a little discipline. But, but, she's, she's only a baby. Sit down, she yelled. Immediately. Willie sat at the table. Uh, has she a name? She brought her fist down hard on the table. No! Now let's see what you've got in those bags, and take that coat off! He emptied the carrier bag first. He placed his thin grey jersey, shorts, cap, Macintosh and Bible on the table beside them. Undo that other bag! He unfastened the straps of the rucksack and slowly began to pull everything out. It felt as though he was stripping naked in front of her. She sat ashen-faced and watched him unpack. When he'd finished, she spoke in a quiet and controlled manner. Now, I'll ask the questions, and you'll give me the answers, and no back chat. Where did you get them clothes and boots you're wearing? Well, Mr. Oakley and, and Mrs. Fletcher. You steal them? No, they were presents. You begged? No, no, never. Don't argue. He took hold of the eggs, fruit cake, wine, and bed socks, and slid them across to her. Well, those are your presents. You begged those too, I suppose. No, I I've got a present of my own for you. It seemed spoiled now. He picked up two pieces of cardboard that were strung neatly together and untied them. Inside was a drawing. It was of the graveyard and the church, with fields and trees in the background. It's, it's where I lived. She looked at it. Now she would be pleased with him, he thought. I, I drew it myself. She looked at him coldly. Don't lie to me. I'm not, look. And he grabbed a sketch pad that was full of drawings. These are mine, too, he said, flicking over the first page. I haven't time to look at pictures, Willie. But I did them myself, please. Look at them. Willie, you've got a lot to learn. I shall either burn these or give them to charity. I only hope that no one ever finds out what you've done. Willie stared at her in dismay. And these? she asked, indicating the books and sweets, coloured pencils and clothes. Presents, he mumbled. More presents, Willie, to expect me to believe that strangers would give you presents. Are they ain't strangers, Mum, they're friends. Friends? Yeah, George and Zack and the twins, and are they churchgoers? Oh, yeah, George is in the choir. They all goes. Well, all except Zack. Jack? Who's he? No, Zack, he said. Short for... And he bit his lip. Some instinct told him that he was approaching dangerous ground. Well, why doesn't he go to church? He tried to evade the question. Well, he, he believes in God, Mum, and he knows his Bible real good. Why doesn't he go to church? He faltered for a second. I, he thinks that there's more God in the fields and sky and in loving people than in churches and synagogues. In churches or what? What did you say? Synagogues, said Willie. Uh, Zach's Jewish. His mother let out a frightened scream. You've been poisoned by the devil, don't you know that? And she rose and hit him savagely across the face. But, Zach, Zach says Jesus was a Jew. You blasphemer, she screamed. You blasphemer. Something heavy hit him across the head, and he sank into a cold darkness. He woke up with a jerk, shivering with the cold. He began to stretch his cramped legs, but they hurt. He knew immediately where he was. He'd been locked under the stairs. He peered through the crack at the side of the small door. It was pitch black. 
His mother must have gone to bed. He shivered. His boots were gone. So were his jersey and shorts. His vest had been sewn to his underpants. He could smell blood. He touched his head and discovered several painful lumps. He felt as though he was a different person lying there in the dark. He was no longer willy. It was as if he'd said goodbye to an old part of himself. Neither was he two separate people. He was Will, inside and out. Mr. Tom, he whispered in the darkness. Mr. Tom, I want you, Mr. Tom. And he gave a quiet sob. Tom waited patiently for a letter from William. By the third week of silence he began to feel anxious. He himself had written four letters. He knew that Zack had sent several also, but there was no reply to any of them. One night he awoke violently from a nightmare. He thought he'd heard William calling out to him for help. It was three a.m. Later that night, on fire duty, he couldn't rid himself of the dream he'd just had. If William was in need of help, surely he would write to him. He gazed out at the galaxy of stars and brooded. On the way home, he caught sight of Miss Thorne's sister May on her ancient bicycle. She was delivering the mail. He ran after her. Oh, nothing for you, I'm afraid, she said. I'm sorry. Mr. Oakley, she added anxiously, I'm afraid I have a telegram. It's for Annie Hartridge. He looked up, startled. The last telegram had brought the news of Michael Fletcher's death. I'm a little worried, she went on. What with her baby due so soon? Tom frowned thoughtfully. You've seen Mrs. Fletcher? She shook her head. I'll go and see her now, he said. Suggest she might pop in to see her. Oh, thank. Tom stepped into the cosy warmth of the Fletcher's kitchen. Sam padded after him. Mrs. Fletcher sat down at the table and poured out two cups of tea. Sit down, she said. There's something wrong, isn't there? I can see it in your face. Annie Hartridge has got a telegram. Mrs. Fletcher put down her cup slowly. What, David? she asked. I don't know, I just thought with you having lost Michael and with her about to have her baby, she might need someone who could help like. Of course, she said, and hurriedly untied her apron. Them uh, trains to London, Tom murmured. Yes, she said, puzzled. They run on, on Fridays, don't they? Yes. He stood up abruptly. I, I'm going to get on that train, Mrs. Fletcher. What's more, I'm going to get on it today. It was nine o'clock when the train pulled into London. Tom clambered out with Sammy and stood on the platform feeling totally dazed. The noise was deafening. Peering through the hordes of uniformed young men, he finally spotted the ticket man. He handed his ticket in. Where's... Dabbotford? asked Tom. Dabbotford? imitated the man. Never heard of it. Ern! he yelled to an ARP warden who was passing. You know where Dabbotford is? Not heard of it, said Ern. And I know most places round London used to be a cabbie. Tom handed them a piece of paper. Oh, you mean Dabbotford? they chorused. They waved their arms over to the left towards an archway and directed him towards a bus station. It was midnight before Tom reached the area where Willie lived. Accustomed now to the darkness, he could make out only too clearly the awful living conditions. 
Suddenly a loud siren wailed across the sky. He froze. What was he supposed to do? He felt a hand on his arm. It was a warden. Why, you seem a little lost, sir. Come with me. Tom picked Sammy up in his arms and ran after him towards a long brick building. The warden, Tom discovered, was the caretaker of the local school. He sat down by Tom. Where are you from, then? he asked, puzzled. You look like a countryman. I am. I've come looking for a boy what stayed with me like evacuee he was. The warden looked astounded. Well, I think you'd best head back home. We've hundreds of the blighters running away. We seen them back. No, oh, he didn't run away, said Tom. Oh? No, I had a letter from his mother saying she was ill-like and could he come back for a while to help out? I ain't heard nothing since. Well, how long has he been gone? Oh, near a month. Well, how long was he with you? Well, near six months. Six months? Tom nodded. Maybe I can help you find this boy, said the warden thoughtfully. What was your name there? Mr. Uh, Oakley. Tom Oakley. Tom brought out the piece of paper with the address on. The warden glanced briefly at it and looked up, startled. Why, it's in this very road. I know number twelve. Willie Beach. Ain't the boy? Tom's heart leapt. You seen him then? Well, not since last September. Quiet boy. Didn't make no friends as such. Sickly looking. His mother thinks she's a cut above everyone. Over-religious type, you know what I mean? Tom nodded. Still, I ain't been notified of him being back. He waved to someone at the far end of the shelter. Glad, he yelled. Here, Glad. A fat woman who was sitting playing cards looked up. Eh, yes, love, she lisped. Where is it? Is Mrs. Beach on night shift this week? Huh? Eh? Man here looking for little Willie. Glad lumbered towards them. Who are you then, sir? Glad asked. Uh, Tom Oakley. Will he stay with him for nearly six months? Glad shrugged. Oh, she keeps herself to herself. Bit of a madam. She does night shift, so uh, I don't never see her. I live next door, you see. Mind you, I don't half hear some funny noises. I'd, I'd like to see where he lives. Oh, you can come with me, love. Oh, oh blimey, I forgot she's gone away to the coast for a Bible meeting or something. She told me last week. I don't know why. After the all clear, Tom was relieved to be outside again. Together, Glad and the warden accompanied him to Willie's home. She fancies herself the foul Mrs. Beach, lisped Glad. She, um... Sometimes rents her bedroom and sleeps downstairs. <laughs> well, you know, so she says. And she winked and gave Tom a nudge. They stood outside number 12 and peered in at the window. Deserted, remarked the warden. Meanwhile, Tom's attention was drawn to Sammy, who'd started to move in an agitated manner outside the window. What's up, boy? You smell something? Sammy began to whine and scratch frantically at the front door. "'There's no one in here, Rover,' said the warden. "'Or well, maybe, but it ain't like him to fuss over nothing.' He jiggled the doorknob. I, "'I think there is someone in there,' said Tom urgently. A policeman who'd been attracted by the commotion joined them. "'This man reckons there might be someone in there,' explained the warden. "'It looks empty to me.' Oh, the dog can smell something by all accounts, said the policeman. After much deliberation, they decided to break the door down. The door crashed open, and they were greeted with a stench so vile as to almost set them reeling. Sammy ran immediately to a tiny door below the stairway, scrabbling at it with his paws. The odour was at its strongest there. The warden lifted aside the latch, and swung the door open. The smell was rank. The policeman shone his torch into the hole.
Side 3 A thin, emaciated boy with matted hair and skin like parchment was tied to a length of copper piping. He held a small bundle in his arms. His scrawny limbs were covered with sores and bruises, and he sat in his own excrement. He shrank at the light from the torch. An empty baby's bottle stood by his legs. "'You give me that baby, son,' said the warden, but the boy tightened himself up, his eyes wide with fear. Tom turned to the policeman. "'I'd like to talk to him. He knows me, like.' The policeman nodded and left to call an ambulance. Tom squatted down. "'It's Mr. Tom,' he said gently. I was, I was worried about you, so me and Sammy come looking for you. Will looked in his direction. He'd have to go to the hospital, said the warden. Will let out a cry. Don't worry, boy, said Tom reassuringly. We'll stay with you, now you just hang tight to that old bundle and I'll untie you. This man's your old school caretaker. Very gently and laboriously he untied him. He knew that Will's limbs would be agony to move. He took hold of him firmly and manoeuvred him gently towards him. He wrapped a blanket round Will and the bundle and carried him to the waiting ambulance. The warden climbed in after him. "'I like to get me hands on it, woman,' he growled furiously. "'She must be off her nuts.' Tom glanced at him. "'I suppose you'll be looking for her.' he commented. Will you try and stop me? He looked intently at the bundle and then at Tom. Tom gave him a nod. Reckon we could find a blanket for the little un like? he asked. The warden caught on immediately. I'm sure we could, Mr. Oakley. And he unfolded one of the blankets. William, whispered Tom. Well? He opened his eyes and looked up at him. Yeah, he whispered. Can I have a look at the little un? Will nodded and relaxed his fingers a fraction. Tom drew the folds of the cold bundle to one side. The baby had been dead for some time. He glanced at the warden. They didn't need to say anything. I've just warmed this blanket up for the little chap, said the warden. It's a her, Will croaked. Oh, girl, is it? What's her name, then? I... I calls her Trudy. Trudy? Oh, that's nice, Willie. I... I ain't... He faltered. I... I ain't... You ain't what? He asked. I... ain't... Willie. The warden looked concerned. It's... Will, whispered Tom. Oh, well, er, uh, Will, began the warden again. As back giving our little Miss Trudy blanket of her own, eh, like yours? Will nodded and released his grip. Hurts, he gasped as he attempted to move his arms. Takes your own time, urged Tom. The ambulance jerked to a halt and the doors were flung open. Tom carried Will out, followed by Sammy and the warden. They pushed their way through two heavy doors into a lobby. A woman with glasses sat behind a small glass window. I'm sorry, she said. No dogs allowed in here. The warden exchanged a few words with her. I see, she said, looking at Tom and Will. There are some railings at the side of the hospital. You could tie him to one of those. I'm sure no one would disturb him. A young man in a white coat came flying out of one of the doors in the corridor, followed rapidly by a nurse. They walked in their direction. The young man glanced at the bundle. Dead, he said abruptly. Dead, whimpered Will. Uh, dead cold, he means, don't you, sir? said the warden, winking urgently at the doctor and indicating the boy. Oh, uh, yes, said the young man. He looked up at Tom. You a relative? Tom shook his head. The warden spoke up for him. 
Uh, the boy stayed with him for six months in the country and he went back home to his mother who said she was ill and now the mother's left the boy. The doctor stood up. Nurse, best take him to the children's ward and clean him up. Tom stood up with Will still in his arms. I'll come with you, said Tom to the nurse. She gave a sigh. You can come as far as the ward, but no further. Will looked terrified when he handed him over to her. I'm staying here, Will, Tom said. I'll be in that big hallway where we were sitting just now. I won't be far away, boy. It was dawn by the time he'd sat down in the lobby. Three ambulances had driven up with casualties, and he'd given the ambulance men and nurses a hand. At last, in the afternoon, a fair-haired nurse came up to him. Are you Mr. Tom? she asked. Yes, he said, standing abruptly. How is he? A psychiatrist has been to see him, Mr. Tom. He's from a special children's home, and he's agreed that it's all right for you to see him. Psychiatrist? How do you mean? A man who cares for sick minds. The child is under deep psychological shock, went on the nurse. He keeps suddenly screaming out for no apparent reason. We've had to keep sedating him. Sedating him? Uh, putting him to sleep. Why? Well, to stop him from screaming. Well, maybe he needs to. Well, that's as may be, Mr. Tom. Well, when can I see him? Uh, no, follow me. Will was propped up by pillows. His hair had been shorn off completely, revealing an array of multicoloured cuts and bruises around his bald skull. Didn't recognise you with your army haircut, said Tom. Will smiled weakly. How are you feeling? Stiff. His lips were pale and cracked, and it was obviously an effort to speak. Uh, I get nightmares, he whispered, and when I wake slightly, they stick a needle in me, and then I, I can't move or speak. He fell back exhausted onto the pillows. "'How long does I have to stay here?' he croaked. "'Or oh, not long, I shouldn't think. You look well patched up. "'Where's Sammy? Outside. Regulations. Not allowed in.' Will leaned awkwardly on one elbow. "'This, uh, this bloke came to see me. Oh, yeah, a doctor, was he?' I don't know. He said he was from a home, and that I'd be going there, and I'd get better there. He clutched at Tom's arm. Can't I come back with you? Of course you can. Well, I don't know the law side, mind, but we'll get round it somehow. Mr. Tom, interrupted the fair-haired nurse from behind him. I'm afraid you'll have to leave now. Will hung tightly to Tom's sleeve. Don't go yet he urged. Stay a bit more. Tom sat closer to him on the bed. I'm sorry, Mr. Tom, said the nurse nervously, but you must go now. What's going on, nurse? boomed a loud noise at the end of the ward. In nothing, sister, said the nurse shakily. The sister walked firmly down the ward towards them. Tom stood up and leaned over Will's bed. I'm afraid I'll have to go, but I'll be in the hallway and I'll see you tomorrow. Will could barely sound the words. Don't go, he pleaded. Don't go. Please leave, sir, said the sister sharply. You're only upsetting the boy. I think it's your regulations what's upsetting him, ma'am. The sister stepped forward. Now go, sir, immediately. Will began to whimper and make grunting noises. Go, shouted the sister. Nurse, sedation. Tom walked dejectedly through the swing doors and listened helplessly to Will's cries. He stood for a moment and then turned to look in through the window. The two nurses were holding Will face down. A few seconds later, Will sank helplessly into the bed, and the nurses let go of him. Uh, Mr. Tom, is it? said a quietly spoken voice behind him. Tom jumped and turned sharply. The man gave Tom a bland smile and held out his hand. "'I'm uh, Mr. Stelton,' he half-whispered. 
I expect William has told you about me. Tom nodded. Yes, he said. He told me you want to put him in an home. Ah, said Mr. Stelton quietly. Did he? And he gave another bland smile. They found a few chairs in a corner and sat down. I deal with disturbed children, said Mr. Stelton, and I work in conjunction with a home. We feel— We? inquired Tom. Well, myself and the head of the school. We feel that he would benefit from treatment there. What sort of treatment? Psychiatric treatment. Analysis. We want to encourage him to talk about his background and find out why he is the way he is. Well, I thought that's pretty obvious, said Tom dryly. Anyway, I'd like him back with me. Ah, sighed Mr. Stelton, making several mental notes. And you can ah till the cows come home. That's what I want, and that's what the boy wants. You're not a relative, Mr. Stelton softly intoned. No, but... Yes, but I'm fond of the boy. Mr. Stelton stood up. We're picking him up the day after tomorrow, Monday. If you'd like to come with us, you're welcome. He gave Tom another neutral smile, shook hands, and padded quietly away down the corridor. Tom walked dejectedly towards the lobby. He stepped outside for some fresh air and paid a short visit to the railing where Sammy was attached. He untied him and they sat on the stone steps. "'What we gonna do, boy?' he murmured. "'Oh, Rachel,' he said half aloud to the sky. What would you do? And he saw her in his mind flash her dark eyes at him. Kidnap him, she said laughingly. Three hours later he was standing outside the children's ward. He peered quickly through the small window. The fair-haired nurse was on duty. She was slumped asleep across a table with a small nightlight beside her. Tom looked quickly around the corridor. There was no one in sight. Before he allowed himself time to think, he crept into the ward and gently eased the swing doors to a close. Will was fast asleep, well knocked out by the drugs. Tom whipped back the sheets, lifted Will out, and wrapped a blanket he was carrying around him. He stuck one of the pillows down the bed and tucked the sheets around it. Holding him firmly in his arms, he stood up. If the nurse woke up now, he thought, he'd be for it. Very quickly he swung the door open and walked firmly out and down the corridor. He knew that if he looked furtive he would give the game away. He headed for the lobby where he'd left his haversack. Two ambulances drew in, and in the general confusion that followed he picked up the haversack and strode towards the swing doors. As soon as he was outside he ran into the dark unlit courtyard, round the corner and down to where he'd left Sammy. Sammy leapt up excitedly and began to bark. No, whispered Tom urgently. He laid Will on the bottom step and feverishly undid the haversack. Quickly he put some warm clothes on him. You keep guard, Sammy, he whispered. The last garment to go on Will was a balaclava which at least hid his bald head. He hid the blanket in a dark corner and wrapped his own overcoat round Will. Slinging the haversack onto his back, he walked firmly towards the open courtyard with Will in his arms. Sammy following. He realized that at any moment they might discover Will's absence. After much climbing on and off of buses, the three of them arrived at the large station. They spent the remainder of the night in a shelter nearby. There were no trains going to Weirwell the following morning, but there was one going two-thirds of the way to a village called Skyrim. Tom hurriedly bought tickets and headed for the platform. The train was due to leave within minutes. At Skyron, Tom began to hitch for a lift. They had three altogether, but Tom walked the final five miles to Weirwold. It was a cool, crisp day. As soon as he saw the river, 
he felt overwhelmingly happy. Not long now, Sammy, he said encouragingly. By the time they reached Weirworld, he was carrying both Will and Sammy in his arms. He tramped over the old cobbled streets as twilight fell towards the blacksmith's. He knocked firmly at his door. Mr. Oakley, cried the brawny, dark-haired man. He's back from London. Oh, you look fair done for, said his wife. Put the boy by the fire. Tom placed him in an armchair by the hearth. Mrs. Stoker turned to look at him. Oh, my love, she said. He's in a bad way. Good job you went for him, Mr. Oakley. It was dark by the time Dobbs was harnessed for the journey. Tom tucked Will up with Sammy in the cart and clambered up to his seat to take hold of the reins. Come on, my old gal, he yelled in delight as Dobbs jogged forward. Take us home. Will awoke to the sound of Tom singing. He opened his eyes to discover a starry sky above him. Mr. Tom, he croaked. Mr. Tom. Tom stopped the cart and turned round. Woken up, eh? Now you ain't dreaming. Lie back, boy. We ain't long from home. But, stammered Will, how did I get here? Tom shook the reins and Dobbs moved forward. I kidnapped you, he said over his shoulder, and then he suddenly realised the enormity of what he'd done and he burst into laughter. Yeah, <laughs> that's what I done, boy. I kidnapped you. Will felt himself being shaken violently into consciousness. He opened his eyes and peered around the darkened room. He could see no one, nor could he even see a window. He raised himself on his elbows and strained his eyes, searching for something recognisable and familiar. A wall was closing in on him, and as it leaned nearer, the ceiling shuddered and began to descend. He leapt out of bed and flung himself at one of the walls in a desperate attempt to find a doorknob. By the time he'd slid his body along the fourth wall, he realised with horror that there was no door. He was trapped. Terrified, he let out a scream. He woke with a frightened start. He was in his bed in the attic bedroom. His pyjamas and sheets were sticking to his drenched skin, and blankets lay scattered about the floor. He heard footsteps coming up the steps. It was Tom. Will clung on to him fiercely. Tom put his arms round his soaking body and held him firmly. Oh, I'm sorry, Mr. Tom. I was frightened. I couldn't help screaming. I had to. You scream as much as you likes. No one will hear you, except perhaps me and Sammy. No, you yell away. Will smiled weakly. Now we'd best get you dried and warmed up. He carried him down the ladder to the front room. Hanging in front of the range were several sheets on a wooden clothes horse. Tom stripped Will, and after he'd sponged and dried him, he put some clean pyjamas on him and wrapped him in a blanket. It was the fifth time that he'd changed the sheets, and had soothed Will after a horrific nightmare. One night Will was so feverish that Tom stayed by his bed, keeping watch. Will moaned and cried out, pushing the blankets away from his legs. He arched his back and gritted his teeth, and with flailing limbs he appeared to be fighting some powerful force. The sweat trickled down him in never-ending streams. Tom felt quite helpless. It was during one particular dream that Will suddenly froze on the bed. He spread his legs and arms outward, as if backing up against a wall, tipped his head back, and let out the wildest and most terrifying scream Tom had ever heard. It sounded like a baby crying in despair, an old, forgotten scream that must have been swallowed down years before. Tom raised him to a sitting position and stroked his back as if he was a baby with wind. Oh, keep, keep breathing, boy, he murmured. Keep breathing. Will released his breath, and as he gulped in a fresh lungful of air, he began to vomit violently. It was after this incident that he began to sleep more easily. 
He had reached the climax of his nightmares, and they no longer haunted him. One morning, several days later, he awoke feeling refreshed. Mr. Tom! he yelled. Mr. Tom! In seconds, Tom's head appeared through the hatchway, and Sammy scampered across the floor and jumped onto his bed. You's looking good, he remarked. You got color in your cheeks. He walked over to the window and removed the blacks. Sunlight danced into the room. Will pushed his legs over to the side of his bed and stood up with a wobble only to sit down suddenly again. Ah, oh, they ain't had much use, commented Tom, noticing the anxious frown on Will's face. Well, get stronger. Remember? But Will finished the sentence for him. Everything has its own time. And he laughed. It was good to see Will smile again. It made Tom feel lively, rejuvenated. Breakfast in bed, sir, he said cheerily. I take it you're hungry. Will nodded and grinned. Downstairs, Tom began to prepare a royal breakfast. As he broke an egg into the frying pan, he started singing. He too felt released. He looked up to find Zack peering in. Come on in, he said. I say blurted out Zack excitedly as he ran breathlessly into the room. He's better, isn't he? Tom nodded. You can see him after he's eaten his breakfast. Oh, gosh, I can't wait till then. He'll take an age with that lot, he said, indicating the toast and mushrooms, egg and bacon. Well, you know what he's like. He chews his food. Oh, that's usual, isn't it? remarked Tom in surprise. Oh, no, I just give mine a few bites and swallow it, but... He chews and chews. Couldn't I sort of drape myself inconspicuously on a chair while he's devouring that lot? You, inconspicuous, commented Tom wryly. You just wait. After what seemed hours to Zack, Will called from upstairs. Zack followed Tom into the hall. All right, said Tom presently. You can come on up. Zack waited impatiently for him to reach the bottom of the ladder, and then, half running, half stumbling, he flung himself upwards. Tom stood in the hallway, listening to their yells of delight. Zack bounced at the end of Will's bed and hit his head on the eave. "'You're ever so bony!' exclaimed Zack. "'But you look much better.' "'Well, my legs are a bit wobbly.' They looked at each other and smiled broadly. I expect you're dying to know all the news, said Zack, crossing his legs and making sure he was quite comfortable. Well, you's going to tell it to me anyway, remarked Will. I say, you've lost your London accent. You've gone all yokel. Have I? Miss Thorne will have the screaming abdabs when she hears you. She gives elocution lessons now to the dramatics group. Will pushed himself up excitedly. What was it like? Toad of Toad all. Oh, great fun. I was marvellous, of course. Missed you, though, terribly. And Carrie. She's still swatting madly for this wretched exam. Folks round here already say she's a queer one. Oh, by the way, Mrs. Hartridge has had a baby girl. A baby? repeated Will, and he paled. I say, are you all right? Yes, said Will quietly. The baby's called Peggy. Oh, dear. I haven't cheered you up very much. Will smiled. Zack sat back and puckered his brows in an effort to remember any other news. 
Oh, yes, there's, there's talk of the Grange being used as a maternity hospital. Hospital, said Will, alarmed. Well, a place where women who can't be at home have their babies. Babies, said Will, feeling sick. Well, yes, said Zack, puzzled at his reaction. Well, don't they come from Jesus, like? Well, of course not. Oh, you don't know. Well, know what? About sex. Will blushed scarlet. I know it's something dirty and you goes to hell for it. Rot! exclaimed Zack. We wouldn't be here if it wasn't for sex. It's what happens between men and women when they love each other. Are you sure? Well, yes. My parents told me and they don't lie. Can't a lady have a baby on her own? No. There has to be a man to give her his seed. He stood up abruptly. I'm going to get Mr. Tom. You look dreadful. Tom popped his head through the hatchway. He glanced at Will. I think you'd best go home, Zack. Overdone it a bit. Uh, y yes, that's what I thought. Can I come again tomorrow? Oh, yeah, please do urged Will. Tom sat at the end of his bed. Now well, then, what's up? Will looked startled. Best tell me. It's, it's about Trudy. She's dead, isn't she? Tom nodded. My fault, Will choked out. My fault, I, I killed her, I made her die. How? Well, she cried and cried, and I, I nursed her like I, I gives her the milk in the bottle, and then there wasn't no more. Well, it ain't your fault, the milk running out. But I, I should have got out like I, I waited. I, I shouldn't have waited. I thought me mum would be back any minute, only... Only she never did. Is that what you're saying? He nodded. Mum lied. Why did she lie? She said men and ladies going with each other were a sin. Tom took out his pipe. I has a feeling that your mother is very ill. It's a sort of sickness of the mind. Mr. Tom, I, I want to stay here. I don't want to go back to her, even if she says she's ill. You won't go back to her. Authorities wouldn't allow it. So why did you kidnap me, then? Well, they were going to put you in a children's home, and I wanted you back here. Well, why? Why? said Tom, embarrassed. Well, because I'm fond of you, boy, that's why. I missed you. And he stood up. Will watched him slowly descend the ladder. Mr. Tom, he said. Tom lifted his head back up through the hatchway. Yes, boy. I love you. Mr. Tom's face became flushed. He cleared his throat. Um, I love you too, boy. Now, uh, I'll get on with downstairs. It was August. The sun shone in a clear, uncluttered Asia sky, and Zack, Tom, and Will were into the third day of their travels on the road heading towards the sea. To his delight, the Littles had given Zack an old bicycle, which he'd managed to fix and paint. Its frame was now a pillarbox red, and the mudguards were yellow. Two panniers were hung onto a small frame which was attached to the back wheel. Tom's bicycle was black, but it was a tandem. Will couldn't ride a bicycle, so being a second rider was the next best thing. Sammy rode in the front basket. 
they cycled steadily and rhythmically on, past fields of fresh swaying corn and lush green trees. Then suddenly, there at last, vast and calm below them, lay the sea. The fishing village they rode into was called Salmouth. They chanced upon a middle-aged widow called Mrs. Clarence, who was delighted to have them stay with her for a fortnight. Her four sons had been called up, and she lived alone with an ancient dog called Rumple. Will was drawn like a magnet towards the small dock. He stood on the ancient wooden jetty and gazed in wonder at the sea. It seemed as if his mind had suddenly opened, and all his worries, painful memories, and fears were flooding to the surface and drifting away. He felt overwhelmingly happy at the thought of spending a fortnight in Salmouth. He could sit by the quay and sketch to his heart's content. The first and second day passed very swiftly, and so too did the days that followed. Most of the time was spent in the sea, the three of them swimming in new woolly swimsuits, or playing cricket on the beach, or building sandcastles and collecting shells. At the end of ten days, Will had learned to do the breaststroke, and Zack could count up to ten while floating. During their stay, the news bulletins on the wireless had begun to grow ominous, so much so that one evening a worried Zack sneaked out of bed to listen to the eight o'clock news. Besides his mother being an ambulance driver, his father was also with the auxiliary fire service. The last morning they stood outside the cottage with their panniers strapped to their frames and said their last farewells to Mrs. Clarence. By the time they had arrived back in Little Weirwold, three days later, it was nearly dusk. Zack leaned his bicycle against the Little's hedge. He was just struggling with a garden gate, when an urgent voice came suddenly out of the darkness. He was so startled that he physically jumped. "'Sorry,' said the voice. "'I don't mean to scare you like. Carrie!' Zack cried in amazement. "'What are you doing here?' "'Oh, Zack!' She clutched his arm and stared fearfully into his eyes. "'What?' he said. "'What's wrong?' "'I passed the exam. I got a scholarship. I'm to be a high school girl.' On August the 31st, the last Saturday before returning to school, Zack, Will, George and the twins sat on an old dead branch beneath the beech trees behind Blake's field. They had all decided to go to Spooky Cot, the deserted cottage in the woods. Will and Zack watched the others crawl along the field to the edge, and then they followed suit in the opposite direction. After a while they hit the woods. Soon they heard the soft, swishing sound of the river, and they slid down its muddy bank. They stood still for a moment and drank in its peacefulness. "'I say we'd better get a move on,' said Zack. "'The others will be there ages before us.' They climbed up the bank towards the trees. As they reached the high hedges which surrounded the cottage, the sky became grey. "'Hope it don't rain,' said Will, peering upwards. "'Still, we could always shelter in spooky cot.' Zack gave a nervous shudder. Just then, three distant hoots came drifting across to them from the other side of the woods. "'I'll give the signal for, let's get nearer,' said Will, and before Zack could prevent him, Will had barked three times and followed it by two howls. Suddenly, from beyond the high hedgerow, came a sound that caused Zack's scalp to tingle to its very roots. "'Caw!' whispered Will excitedly. The sound was high-pitched and seemed to come from the cottage. It soared and dipped, sending an eerie chill through the undergrowth surrounding it. They froze, hardly daring to breathe. Zack began to feel a little sick. It wasn't long before a rather shaky, let's-get-out-of-here signal came soaring from the other side of the hedge. Dope bags, said Will, just as it's getting exciting. The high wail from the cottage floated through the air again. "'It's like what Mr. Tom sometimes plays on the organ,' Will whispered. He turned to Zack. "'You still game?' Zack nodded, knowing well that each nod was a lie. Will walked slowly forwards, 
and stood in the middle of the tangled garden opposite it. The music seemed to touch some painful and tender place inside him. You can come in if you like, boomed a man's voice from the darkness. Will jumped, and Zack screamed and fell over backwards. A young man in his mid-twenties, with brown wavy hair, blue eyes and a moustache, appeared at the doorway. His left trouser leg was pinned up to his thigh, and he supported himself on a crutch. One of his ears was missing. He observed them, looking him over. Not a pretty sight, eh? he said at last. Will and Zack were too surprised to speak. Sorry if I scared you. Thought you must have seen me through the window. You like music? Will nodded. Mr. Tom plays some on the organ, like, he said quietly. I, uh, lives with him. You local, then? Mm, no. Vacuee? Yeah. Where from? Deptford. Oh, if there's any left of it. I used to live in London till nine months ago. No reason to go back now, he added grimly. The man held out his hand. Geoffrey Sanderton's my name. Will stepped forward and shook it. I'm Will. And I'm Zacharias Wrench, said Zack, stumbling to his feet. Ah, he has a voice, said Geoffrey. I can offer you tea, bread and jam. That suits you. You can either sit out here or come inside. Uh, I'd like to come in, blurted out Will. I, I mean, if that's all right, like. I'll sit on the step, said Zack. Will followed Geoffrey into the front room. His attention was caught by the piles of paper and bits of canvas scattered about the floor and a tall wooden easel. "'Are you a painter, mister?' Will asked, following him into the kitchen. "'An artist, you mean? Yes. I had my first exhibition in London just before I was called up. "'Were you a Dunkirk?' "'Yes.' "'Cool.' Good job you didn't lose your arms, eh, mister? Lucky, eh? Lucky, he repeated with bitterness. He didn't think so. His fiancée had been blown out of his arms by a bomb, he'd lost two of his closest friends, and his parents had been found dead under a pile of rubble. His leg and ear had been blown off, and he'd had a nervous breakdown. Hardly lucky. Yeah, said Will. Well, you can still draw, like. You draw? asked Geoffrey. Yeah. What, at school? What, well, any me free time. Do you? said Geoffrey in surprise. He handed a piece of paper and a stubby pencil to Will. Show me. Show you? said Will in alarm. But um, you, you're so good. And you're not? He's marvellous, said Zack, coming in. Will blushed. Uh, I'll, I'll draw outside and with that he pushed Zack aside and went and sat on the steps. Will could feel his ears burning as Geoffrey approached. He'd drawn a rough sketch of Sammy by the oak tree. Geoffrey peered down at it. How do you? I'm ten next week. He gazed quietly down at Will's sketch and after a short silence said, You have a gift, Will. Will's heart soared. Who teaches you art? Well, I used to have Mrs. Hartridge, but she's left. She's got a baby, see? Short of teachers, are they? said Geoffrey. Yes, replied Zack. They picked up the slices of bread and jam and began eating. I'll see if I can teach at your school, said Geoffrey at last, and as he spoke he felt happier than he'd felt for a long time. Would you like extra lessons of your own, Will? Will thought his heart would explode through his chest. He nodded. Wizzo! yelled Zack. I told you one day you'd be famous. Geoffrey glanced up at the sky. I'll put the placards up and light the fire. The fire was soon licking its way up the chimney, sending a warm glow around the candlelit cluttered room. Geoffrey took a record out of its sleeve and put it onto a turntable. It gave a few crackles and then burst into music. "'That was the Brahms violin concerto you heard in the garden,' said Geoffrey. Zack stood at Will's side. "'And think I was scared out of my wits by that?' 
They listened to it again, without talking, sitting cross-legged by the fire. When the music had ended, the two boys stood up to leave. They said their goodbyes and headed towards the woods. Will ran up the path to Tom's cottage, pushed open the front door and slammed it behind him. He couldn't wait to tell Mr. Tom about Geoffrey and the art lessons. He flung open the door, his cheeks burning. Sitting in the room with Mr. Tom were a policeman from Weirwold, the warden from Deptford, a middle-aged man in a pullover and corduroys, and a woman in a green hat and coat. "'There's the boy?' asked the policeman. The warden stared at Will's brown, freckled face and thick, shiny, bleached hair. The boy he was looking at stood straight and had muscles on his legs. He wasn't the thin, weedy Willie he knew. "'Well, this ain't Willie Beach, is it?' he said. "'William,' corrected Will. "'I'm afraid we've brought you some rather bad news, William,' the woman said. "'It concerns your mother.' He looked at her, startled. "'I'm afraid your mother is dead. She committed suicide.' He looked blankly at her. "'I don't get you. She killed herself.' Will gazed at her in stunned disbelief. "'Killed herself? But, but why?' "'I don't know. I suppose she just didn't want to live any more.' "'I'm from a children's home in Sussex,' she explained. "'It's an orphanage, and it's right out in the country. There are lots of children there, and we usually find foster parents to take them into their homes, young parents with children of their own.' And she smiled. "'What the lady's saying,' said the policeman, "'is that she's willing to have you at the home.' Will thrust his hands deep into his pockets. "'No,' he said, somewhat shakily. I, I, "'I'm not willing. This is my home when I'm staying here.' "'Now, now, son,' said the warden, "'you don't have much choice in the matter. "'Your Mr. Oakley has not been keeping to the law. "'Kidnapping's a serious offence. Will took a deep breath. "'Well,' I reckon I weren't kidnapped. I reckon I was rescued. Oh, oh, you do, do you? said the warden. And then, as if he was no longer in the room, the policeman, the warden, and the woman began to discuss him. Will and Tom just looked at each other, and all the while the middle-aged man in the big jersey and corduroys sat by the range smoking a pipe and silently observed them. Well, said the policeman, We'd like you to go up to your room for a while until we make up our minds. Will glanced at Tom. Tom nodded and handed Sammy over to him. Here, boy, he said gently. Will trailed mournfully to the door and whirled round in a great surge of anger. I won't go with you, he stated firmly. Even if you tie me up and put me in prison, I'll run away and I'll come back here. With that, he slammed the door behind him and stood in the hallway, trembling. Clutching Sammy in his arms, he clambered up the ladder to his room. At last, the front door shut, and he heard Tom coming up the ladder. "'I'm gone,' he said, lifting up the trapdoor. He climbed down the steps with Sammy. Tom sat in the armchair. "'I'm sorry about your mother.' Will forgot his anger for a moment and caught Tom's eye. "'I don't know why she, she did it,' he said, feeling totally bewildered. Well, "'Was it because of me and Trudy?' "'Well, partly,' said Tom. "'But weren't your fault. She was ill. She couldn't cope, see?' "'What's, what's going to happen to me, then?' Tom looked up at him quickly. "'I'm adopting you.' "'What?' exclaimed Will. "'Why, you ain't got no other relations, boy. "'That man in the jersey and corduroys, "'he were one of them psychiatrists. "'Now, you were a bit different from that other one. "'Anyway, he said that this were obviously the best place for you, "'and any fool could see that, and the others agreed. "'If all goes well, and I don't say it can't, "'you'll be my son.' "'Your son?' cried Will. You mean you'll be my father, like? Tom nodded. 
Oh, I, I suppose I will. With a great yell of joy, he leapt up from the armchair. Will threw his arms around him, and together they danced and cavorted across the room, shouting and yelling, while Sammy whirled around their ankles, chasing his tail and barking in lunatic fashion. One Thursday, when they arrived at school, to their surprise and delight, sitting next to Miss Thorne at the front of the class, was Geoffrey Sanderton. Mr. Sanderton and I have decided to choose a nature project, began Miss Thorne. This means that we shall be going on expeditions which you will plan. We would also like some of you to write and illustrate a nature diary. Miss Thorne was interrupted by a knock at the door. Geoffrey opened it. Zack looked towards the hallway and was surprised to see Aunt Nance. Miss Thorne disappeared into the hallway with her and returned shortly. She glanced at Zack. "'You ought to go home,' she said gently. Zack felt very hot and a little sick. He rose quietly from his desk and left the classroom. As soon as it was lunch, Will ran to the littles and knocked on the back door. "'Oh, come in, Will,' said Mrs. Little, opening it. Zack will be pleased to see you. He's upstairs, packing. Packing? gasped Will. Why? What's wrong? Oh, his father has been badly injured in a fire. He's in a hospital in London. Will ran upstairs and found Zack kneeling over a small battered case. He was holding a photograph of his father. He looked up at Will. "'I'm catching the Friday train to London,' he said, his voice quivering. "'Mother doesn't want me to, but I—I I begged her to let me. I, I have to see him in case—' And he became hoarse and stifled a sob. "'Well, in case I never see him again.' Will squatted down beside him. "'I want you to take care of this,' he said, handing him his old, tattered copy of Shakespeare's work. It was my great-grandfather's. Oh, Zack, protested Will, but Zack's pained expression prevented him from refusing. Oh, I'll look after it real fine. The day after Zack's sudden departure was Will's tenth birthday, Saturday, September the 7th, 1940. Mrs. Fletcher and Mrs. Thatcher arrived armed with home-baked cakes and biscuits, while Aunt Nance brought homemade ginger beer and a parcel that Zack had left for Will. By late afternoon, the cottage was filled with children, with Tom, Ginny, and George leading the games. Will left Zack's parcel unopened until the last person had gone home, and he and Tom had sat down to relax with a cup of tea. Inside was part one of an epic adventure called The Villainous Doctor Horror. At the bottom was a little postscript. It read, P.S. Part two will be written on my return. In addition to the poem were two new paintbrushes, a second-hand book on painters, and a lopsided sketch of Will in an artist beret and smock. It showed him standing at an easel. The canvas on the easel was empty, but Will himself was covered in paint. I shall put that on my wall said Will. At eight o'clock they listened intently to the news on the wireless. It was reported that flares had been dropped all over London, and hundreds of German planes had been spotted. Spitfires and hurricanes had soared up into the skies to fight them. It was one of the longest massed raids that London was experiencing. Oh, Zack's all right, said Will, frowning. Tom puffed at his pipe. Why, well, he's so skinny. A bomb will probably skip past him. I hope so. Two mornings later he awoke to the sounds of voices downstairs. It was odd to have visitors so early. He rose quickly and clattered down the ladder. As he approached the front room he recognised the voices. They were the littles. His heart gave a lift. Perhaps they had news of Zack. He strode in excitedly. Dr. Little looked grave, and Aunt Nance had been crying. 
They didn't need to say anything. He knew that Zack was dead. In one black moment he felt his legs buckling up underneath him, and he collapsed into unconsciousness. In the weeks that followed the news of Zack's death, Will survived each day in a zombie-like daze. Outwardly, he carried on as normal, helping Tom and catching up with schoolwork. Inwardly, he felt too numb even to cry. Even in drawing and painting classes, he would sit and look blankly at the empty page in front of him, devoid of ideas. His private classes with Geoffrey Sanderton were just as bad. I ain't got anything left inside me, he would say repeatedly, for he felt that half of himself had been cut away, that life without Zack was only half a life, and even that half was empty. Four months passed. Christmas saw heavy rationing, but Will didn't notice. Carrie had completed her first term at the high school. She missed Zack dreadfully, for he was one of the few people with whom she didn't feel such an odd fish. She didn't dare let her parents know of the unpleasanter aspects of grammar school life, as her mother still didn't approve of her going, and her father had worked so hard for her uniform and sports clothes. Her main embarrassment was her accent. Most of the girls in the school spoke a different kind of English, a posh BBC English like Zack. Their parents paid fees, whereas she was a poor scholarship girl, with an accent that many of the other girls either ridiculed or could not understand. She called in on Will several times, but as soon as she mentioned Zack, he would always abruptly change the subject. This added to her loneliness, for she dearly wanted to talk about him to someone. One chill afternoon in January, however, an unforeseen event caused Will finally to accept Zack's death. He set off towards Spooky Cot, taking as usual the route around the fields on the Grange side. He always avoided retracing the way he and Zack had taken on their last morning together. Geoffrey opened the door of his cottage. Hello, he said cheerily. I just put the kettle on. Sling your coat on an armchair and make yourself warm. After they'd drunk their tea, Geoffrey put the teapot on the mantelpiece above the fire. Beside it, he placed a photograph of two young men with their arms around each other. They seemed to be laughing a great deal. In front of the teapot, he laid his pipe. Those are your subjects for this afternoon. Will recognised one of the young men as Geoffrey. Well, who's the other man? he asked. Is, is he your brother? Best friend, he replied. Killed in action, very talented, brilliant sculptor. Oh, said Will quietly. Uh, that's his pipe, actually. You use his pipe? Yes, I knew he would have wanted me to have it. Makes him still a little alive for me whenever I smoke it. Do you understand? Will didn't, nor did he wish to. It was bad enough possessing Zack's old Shakespeare. He sat down immediately to work. Usually he could immerse himself totally in the objects he was drawing, but every time he caught sight of the laughing young man in the photograph and the pipe, it disturbed him. He attempted to draw steadily, but found his hand trembling. Suddenly he saw Zack on his colourful bicycle, singing and lifting his arms high in the air, yelling, Look, no hands, and falling straight into a hedge. Time to stop, Geoffrey said, and he peered over Will's shoulder. Um, I'm sorry mumbled Will. I don't seem to be able to... Uh... His voice trailed into silence. Sit down by the fire and I'll toast us some muffins. While Will was gazing dreamily into the fire, he heard a click. Geoffrey had opened the gramophone and was winding it up. Well, what are you doing? Putting on some music. It was the same that he and Zack had listened to, the day they'd first come to the cottage. 
Will wanted Geoffrey to take it off, but he couldn't bear to speak or look at him in case he broke down, so he returned to staring at the fire. As he did so, he suddenly felt that it was not just he who was gazing into the flames. It was both he and Zack. He could feel Zack sitting beside him. As soon as the record had come to an end, he grabbed his balaclava and coat. I, I must leave. Uh, get back, he choked out hoarsely. Geoffrey squeezed Will's shoulder gently. It's better to accept and pretend that he never existed, he said quietly. Will didn't want to hear. He stumbled into the darkness, and instead of leaving through the gap in the hedge, he headed blindly in the direction of the woods and river. Tripping and falling over the roots of trees, he scratched his face against unseen branches. At last he finally reached the river. He felt again Zack's presence next to him, felt him staring up at the starry night and coming out with some strange fragment of poetry. No, no, he whispered, shaking his head wildly. No, no, you're not here. You'll, you'll never be here. Catching his breath for a moment, he stood up stiffly, and looked up through the branches of the trees. I hate you, God, I hate you. You hear me? I hate you, I hate you, I hate you. He stood yelling and screaming at the sky until he sank exhausted and sobbing onto the ground. He'd no idea how long he'd lain there. It felt like a year. He hauled himself up the bank and stumbled through the woods. Tom was waiting for him by the gate. Will's face was covered in earth and tear stains, and his lips and eyelids were swollen and puffy. Tom put an arm round Will's shoulders as they walked along the pathway to the cottage. Just as he was opening the front door, Will turned quickly. I'm, I'm sorry, Dad, he said. I, I didn't think you'd be worried like I, I had to be on my own sea. I had to. I, I forgot about you. I, I, I didn't think. Sorry. You're home now, said Tom. You look fair whacked. You'd best get washed and go to bed. It wasn't until Will was asleep that Tom allowed the full impact of Will's words to sink in. He, he called me Dad, he whispered croakily. He called me Dad. And although he felt overwhelmed with happiness, the tears ran silently down his face. Will! cried Aunt Nance, opening the back door. She was speechless for a moment. Come in, come in! Will stepped into the kitchen. Mulled wine? she began, and then stopped herself. Mulled wine was Zack's nickname for hot black currant juice. Here, please, answered Will, and he sat down and watched her making it. Oh, we've missed you coming round she said, joining him at the table. I've left Zack's room as it was, Dr. Little and myself. We didn't want to touch anything until you'd been, until you wanted us to. All right? Will looked up and smiled. Yeah. Can I ride his bike? What? she queried, surprised. What did you say? Well, can I ride his bike? Zack's? Yeah. Well, I didn't know you could ride. Well, I can't. Not yet, but I will. They dragged the bicycle out of the Anderson shelter and wiped the moistness off with an old dry rag, oiled it, and reset the back wheel. One of the inner tyres had a hole in it. With the help of Aunt Nance and Zack's puncture kit, Will patched it up. It was a strange feeling working on the bicycle, like touching a part of Zack. He wheeled it round the cottage and through the long, overgrown grass. He carried on until he'd found a reasonably smooth stretch of road, and then he swung his leg over the saddle and sat still for a moment. He placed the toe of his boot on one of the pedals. Gritting his teeth and taking a deep breath, he pushed it down and wobbled forward. The bicycle curved and swooped into a nearby hedge. He picked himself up, and climbed back onto the seat. At times he managed to keep the bicycle balanced for a few yards, only to swerve into another clump of brambles or icy nettles. 
He could hear his dad's words over and over again inside his head. Take your time. Everything has its own time. But whether it was because it was Zack's bicycle or because the colours were so intense, he felt frustrated and impatient. He wanted to learn now. Soon he began to grow confident. He understood now why Zack loved riding so much. There was a marvellous feeling of freedom once you'd got the hang of it. As he rode, his coat flapping behind him, the crisp wind cooling his face, he suddenly felt that Zack was no longer beside him. He was inside him and very much alive. Yippee! Kelu Kale! he yelled. Wizzo! he cried, steering the bright machine with a new dexterity round a corner. He wheeled the bicycle up to the brow of a hill. It was wonderful to stand at the top with it leaning gently against his body. He breathed in deeply. Well, Zack isn't dead, he murmured. Not really. Not the inside of Zack. And he gazed happily down at the fields. Well, no one can take memories away, and I can talk to him whenever I want. Now, Zack, he said out loud, what shall I do now? Oh, I should return slowly and leisurely back, he replied to himself, and pop in to see Annie Hartridge. What a good idea, said Will. And, oh, I say, continued the imaginary Zack, jolly well done, learning to ride my bike, and Will patted himself on the back. Annie opened the door, holding a telegram in her hands. She was crying. Oh, hello, Will she said, half laughing. Oh, come in, do come in. She closed the door behind him. I've just had the most wonderful news. Mr. Hartridge is alive. He's in a prisoner of war camp in Germany. We can write to each other, and I can send him Red Cross parcels, food parcels. Oh, well, she cried. I'm so happy. She looked at Will's grubby face and followed his body down to his feet. What have you been doing? You're covered in grazes and scratches. Oh, I've been learning to ride Zack's bike, he said absently. Annie was speechless for a moment. What did you manage to stay on it? she said at last. Eventually, he answered, plunging his hands into his shorts pocket and leaning on one leg. Why are you... But she stopped. She was about to say that he looked and sounded... A little like Zack. He had an extrovert air about him. That was unusual in Will. During the weeks that followed the bicycle riding incident, everyone noticed a dramatic change in Will, especially Amelia Thorne. She had decided to do her own version of Peter Pan. She cast Will to play Peter Pan, but to her surprise, he stood up in the hall and in front of everyone said, uh, I'd like to play Captain Hook, may I? Miss Thorne had been a little taken aback. Captain Hook was a comic, flamboyant role. Well, let's try you out, she said, after recovering her breath. Will surprised her and everyone in rehearsals. Unbeknown to the others, while working on his lines up in his room, he would place a cushion in front of himself and say, Zack, how do you think I should say this line, or how do you think Hook's feeling in this bit? Then he would sit on the cushion and not only answer his questions as Zack, but even deliver the lines as him. The play was a great success. Will had people laughing helplessly at his angry Hook outbursts of temper and his cowardly flights from the crocodile. It was so obvious that the audience loved Will that when several of the children pushed him forward to take a separate bow, the hall erupted into cheers. Tom was terribly proud of him, but then he had been for a long time. As Will lay back in his bed that night, he felt a little sad in spite of all the applause. He was sad that Zack hadn't been there to share it. He realized now that the Zack he'd been talking to for the last few weeks was a person created from his own imagination and a handful of memories. It was just that the Zack part of himself 
the outgoing, cheeky part of himself, had been buried inside him, and it was his friendship with Zack that had brought those qualities to the surface. I'm not half a person any more, he thought. I'm a whole one. I can live without Zack, even though I still miss him. He turned over and listened to the wind howling through the graveyard. He was warm and happy. He sighed. It was good to be alive. Thank you.